uh, can I start? Yeah, I'm all set. Uh, a very good morning to all and a warm welcome to Entrepreneurship Summit 2022. E-Summit is the largest and one of its kind entrepreneurship festival conducted each year that aims to provide a conduit by which students can access entrepreneurial resources, network with the community entrepreneurs and share ideas. It is an initiative to serve as a platform for bringing together budding entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, investors, startups, and everyone else with the spirit of entrepreneurship. In line with our motive of spreading the spirit of entrepreneurship, this year we have already hosted Basecamp, our flagship business plan competition. Today, we'll be hosting two events. One is Innovator Talk Series, and the other one is Entrepreneurship Conference. The Innovator Talk Series features eminent personalities, think tanks, who are changing the face of the entrepreneurship in our country. The innovators would be sharing their experiences as well as challenges faced by them. And Entrepreneurship Conference, a platform where FMS Delhi invites business leaders to its campus to share their valuable experience and knowledge with academia. The panelists of the Entrepreneurship Conference discusses on a topic that attempts to give students and aspiring entrepreneurs a glimpse of the rapidly changing industry from the perspective of top leaders. So, our first speaker of the day is uh, Rajesh Mago. Uh, he's the founder and CEO, founder and group CEO of Make My Trip Limited that runs and operates India's leading travel brands, Make My Trip, Goa Vivo, and Red Bus. A part of the founding team that built Make My Trip Ground Up, Rajesh is a believer of India's digital opportunity and a backer of many Indian tech companies that are rearing to make their mark in the industry. So over to you, sir. You can take the session. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, everyone. I guess uh, this is the first session in the morning, I was just told. So hopefully it's a, it's a good start for, for everyone. I wish, though, that this was more an in-person um, session rather than a virtual. I'm sure, like me, everyone else is sort of done with the zoom sessions virtual sessions now uh, but i guess the good news is that things are getting better now uh, right um, as you can see around you uh, there are people have started to sort of uh, go out colleges and universities have opened up which is like an absolutely refreshing sign i'm sure for you and for everyone else, else as well and given that we are in the travel business which was the worst hit during pandemic it is very very welcome news uh, but I, I, you know, it's absolutely no substitute, I think, for in-person sessions when you're interacting with people than, uh, you know, doing it over the Zoom. But, but anyways, I mean, you know, I guess today we will have to just live with the Zoom session. Um, so I guess in the next 15, 20 minutes, the time slot that I have, um, you know, what I thought would be interesting for you all um, is some important sort of uh, phases of this, the story, the Make My Trip story, uh, rather than just going the entire story. Because uh, I thought, given the, the massive down cycle that we had thanks to pandemic for the last two years, where uh, industry and you know we were not any different, we were part of the industry, were very, very badly hit. I thought it would be interesting for you all um, to sort of uh, hear um, what I was trying to do was to just compare it with uh, maybe the first challenge that we faced in the journey of Make My Trip and the current challenge that we have and what are the learnings from that. Um, and, and then we will probably talk about maybe, you know, how are we going to go from here? What's going to be the future? Is there going to be any impact uh, of this pandemic from a long-term standpoint on travel and tourism industry, et cetera, as well? And would be happy to take any questions that you might have. So let me just uh, take you all back, and I don't know how many of you would be able to relate with uh, with this, because or you might be very very young at that point in time. Um, you know, we started Make My Trip has been around now for over two decades. We actually started way back in 2000. Uh, when uh, and you know, when I look at hindsight, and it seems like uh, that was the age from a digital age standpoint or digital evolution standpoint. Uh, it was primitive. It was an absolute primitive age at that point in time. Like first five years, we used to be on an narrowest possible band. 
uh, although the internet users were about 120 million even back then, given the size of our population, but all of them were on uh, you know narrow band. And if I just go back a little bit before 2000, let's say 95, 96, 97, we used to be on dial-up connection, believe it or not. I mean, you, I'm, I'm not sure that you'll be able to relate with that sort of uh, funny noise that the dial-up modem used to make. I remember I used to, before make my trip in, in when I was in Aptec, uh, 96, 97, I used to do uh, dial-up connection to check my emails morning, evening. So those were the times back then when we sort of started, seems like, you know, really veteran of the industry, but the industry is pretty young. It's just about 20 years, right? And maybe 15, 16 years old uh, at best. Um, so what were the challenges during that time? Now, the challenges we had, I mean, as a startup, as you could possibly imagine, there would be a ton of challenges of different kinds. There would be challenges of survival. You know, would you really survive? There would be challenges around whether we'll be able to raise capital. Uh, you know, and back then, uh, uh, the kind of liquidity that we have today in the startup ecosystem, neither the startup ecosystem was very developed, nor there was, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the capital that was available uh, for startups. So uh, we had, I, I remember we had a commitment of, say, a couple of million dollars, just about $2 million. And we only got one tranche out of that, which was about a million dollar. And then the second did not happen because 9-11 happened and, and SARS pandemic happened and, and 2000, um, uh, you know, uh, it SARS happened and then 9-11 happened in 2001, right? So, uh, and, and like I said, that digital space was very primitive uh, and, and it wasn't really taking off, taking off from, from our point of view. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting trivia back then. I mean, you know, talking about the challenges as we always see challenges and then the learnings and the opportunities come out of that. I, I remember the first time when we had only one month money uh, to run the shop, like literally one month money. And I think we would have done possibly everything possible to raise money short of stealing the money, of course, you know, putting, our, putting in our own money. Uh, you know, we borrowed money from here and there. We went back to drawing board. We we stopped sort of burning in um, marketing and we realized India wasn't really ready. So we took a step back and we somehow survived because we were able to find uh, a, a niche, which was essentially just keep going, keep staying on course with the website, which is live for US because we didn't really have to uh, you know, sell this sort of concept or model to the U.S. audience and, and only non-resident Indians who were based out of U.S. And, and through the travel sort of solutions uh, of them coming into India or going back to U.S. So only NRI's focus portal we ran for about good five years to survive. So what, what was the learning? Now, the challenge was clearly even at that point in time, if you see the intensity of challenge, there was an existential crisis as well, more so because, because we were all professionals and the opportunity cost was really, really high. So Deep Kalra, who founded the organization and the founding team, including me and a couple of my colleagues, Kayur and Sachin, all four of us were professionals. I mean, we, we didn't come straight out of college and set the startup. Uh, and, and therefore the opportunity cost was really, really high at that point in time. And then you would every now and then would hear from, as you could possibly imagine, from the friends and the families, the extended families and saying, you know, you're probably wasting your time. What are you doing? I mean, you know, you should be just going back to the corporate world and so on. I guess the biggest learning for us was uh, that we hung in there, you know, and I think if you are looking at just um, uh, starting an entrepreneurship journey, I think that is the biggest lesson. It is uh, not a short haul. It is always a long haul uh, journey and there would be many pivots and before getting into it, you should think through really, really hard. But once you are into it, you got to give some more time. You know, it's not that, you know, then you give up in a, in a year's time and so on. That was at least our learning. Uh, we hung in there and it, it sort of worked out because uh, we had the belief. And that's, a, that's also very important learning. See, if you don't have the courage of conviction, if you don't really have the belief in the model, in fact, recently, and I thought it was a very, very sensible call that someone took because those kind of situations could also happen where I just heard the story. I, I, I won't name the, the startup, but the founders actually took a call and saying this 
model, I, you know, we've lost uh, sort of faith. We tried to do the proof of concept in the market. It doesn't seem to be working. And we are taking the call and returning the money that we had raised from the investors, part of money that we had raised from the investors. I thought it was also a sensible call. So there could be situation like that. But mostly, there would be situations where you would end up pivoting and not necessarily completely shutting down your operations. Right. So from our point of view, there was belief in the model. Uh, and we, 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 it was just a matter of time from our point of view. And therefore, it was important for us to, to sort of hang in there. It was never easy. You know, looking back, it's always easy, as we all know. But it was never easy at that point in time. Now, that was the sort of phase that we had for five years, imagine, right? From 2000 to 2005, the turnaround happened in September 2005 when we actually raised more money and Sky opened up. And then from 2006 to, to I would say, 2020, was a great period, you know, high growth, three brands, merger happened, IPO happened in 2010, um, fantastic run. I'm sure there would be hiccups in, uh, you know, along the journey as well, because there's, there's never a dull moment in Make My Trip, as we all say in Make My Trip. Uh, but let me just fast forward and compare it with now the current uh, challenge that we faced in 2020. Now, in 2020, the biggest difference as the pandemic hit us, right? So we all remember February 20, um, early March 20, when, uh, uh, you know, this sort of came from nowhere. Uh, it was a serious pandemic. A lot of people could not even sort of, um, no one really could anticipate, anticipate, but also, would, uh, you know, was sort of out of place, what to, how to deal with it also. Like at, a, at even a... Uh, even uh, even at the country level, I think we were all sort of grappling with the fact that um, and struggling that how are we going to sort of deal with this sort of uh, massive crisis uh, that came from nowhere. Now, how was it different from uh, the challenge that I told you in the early stage of our life versus this stage of our life? Let me just give you some facts and then you'll be able to sort of relate with that. See, that point in time, we were very, very small. You know, I gave you the ticket size of the capital. We had only 1 million. We had only, what, 20, 30 people that we were dealing with. Very small operations. And therefore, we could all get together, figure out what to, what to do, etc. And we were able to mobilize whatever funds that we, we needed. And we didn't really need a lot of funds also, right? Now here in 2020, imagine we were three big brands, we were 3000 people and the drop, the, the fall in the revenue right after the, mm, our Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Modi announced the country lockdown, we were down by 95%. Our revenues were down by 95%. Right? It probably will give you the taste of the intensity of this um, virus, of course, was very intense and lethal, as we all know. But the impact of the virus on the business, how lethal was it? It was, it was absolutely lethal. Now, that is what the kind of uh, different uh, challenge that we were dealing with. Um, I think the other big difference was also that this time around, uh, you know, we were, it was sort of a dual attack. It was one, uh, the business obviously went down. Um, and the other bigger, uh, biggest one was also that, um, that the people, the health of people were at stake. Uh, and, and, you know, and, 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 and therefore, uh, you know, there was challenges around, you know, how do we sort of uh, help people because, you know, every um, one in, you know, or the other was sort of falling sick. Uh, there was panic all around. Uh, there were obviously there was tremendous amount of fear uh, for any of the family members to get uh, hit by COVID, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So um, on one side, it was more how do we sort of uh, deal with this crisis in the business. The other side was also people related crisis, right? Because you know you also had to be out there talking to people and so on and so forth. So. Massive crisis, you know, yes, thankfully, we had the learnings from the past um, or uh, having dealt with many down cycles in the journey of Make My Trip. Uh, so maybe some learnings we had, 
but it was clearly mother of all uh, crisis and therefore it had to be dealt very differently as well. What did we end up doing? Uh, I'll tell you very quickly because that from that is uh, where the learning would come from. I think the first thing first was very important uh, uh, from our point of view and thankfully there the, the learning from the past sort of helped us uh, as well that we needed to go back to the drawing board uh, and figure out how are we going to manage our costs because we had 3000 people uh, and we had our cost base which was you know quite a bit of it was also fixed but you know there was also variable cost that we we had and we had to attack pretty much every sort of cost item uh, and on, on and on war footing right because the revenue had fallen uh, off the cliff literally uh, so we had to just very quickly gather but before we uh, you know got into that action i think there was one important thing which i would like to share that i think will be very very relevant anyone who goes through any down cycle any crisis i i think what is important is that you can't give a panic reaction uh it you it the moment you panic, I think the, the thinking ability goes away. Uh, rather than panicking and, and you know, sort of uh, feeling helpless, what is important is that we sit back and we figure out what are the actions that needs to be taken. Uh, the challenge is obviously humongous. There's no question about it. But I think it's important to gather yourself, get back, and think more in terms of what actions needs to be taken in the given situation. And that's precisely what we ended up doing. Uh, of course, you know, uh, I would be lying if I would say that, you know, the, it wasn't really stressful and the rest of it. A lot of people in my, uh, you know, town hall meetings, they asked me that question and said, of course, I mean, it was all very high pressure, stressful and all of that. But more importantly, the focus was that what do we need to do? And 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 that was keeping uh, you know not only me but the entire leadership team in make my trip busy, and we didn't take too much time to fix the situation. I think we took we took maybe at best a couple of months to sort of fix this part of the problem. Luckily, you know, back then in two thousand we didn't have money. We we have we had money uh, on our balance sheet, so it wasn't a, qu a question of that we were running out of cash. Uh, luckily, but it was a massive sort of challenge around the PL management. Uh, and we are a listed company. So, you know, stakeholders management, you know, and people management, like I told you, because of the safety of the people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the multi, and, you know, we were like three uh, big brands, uh, scaled up operations, uh, huge amount of revenue, and so on and so forth. So, you have to mentally deal with all of this, but you have to also, uh, you know, uh, also think through the solution. So we, we were in solution mode, we were able to, to sort of uh, fix this in a couple of months. Then I guess the other important thing was also, which is also the learning in the crisis and the down cycle where people forget doing that. You know, you're busy dealing on crisis and, you know, again, I won't sort of blame anyone uh, because that's the need of the hour and then you'll have to end up doing. But if you have to stay on course, uh, as market leader and as a, as an organization or as the leader that uh, which will always sort of stay ahead and remain the market leader, then you also in parallel need to think about how are we going to um, emerge even more stronger on the other side of the pandemic. So whenever that pandemic goes away, back then our estimate was about one year. In fact, I was saying maybe about 18 months and it has taken more about 24 months now you know and it's it's uh, hopefully this is the last phase and and we won't have any sort of variant uh, but clearly it took much longer than anyone sort of expected and therefore you needed to have the playbook not only to continue to keep surviving but and and uh, and you know dealing with the challenges but also think strategically uh, what is that you need to do to make sure that you emerge even more stronger? And I think uh, we, like I said, in, in one track, we were just managing the crisis. The second track, we got back and we attacked. Uh, I think in the history of Make Matri, we would have probably delivered a lot more projects, you know, in that short span of 18 months, um, more than ever in the history of Make Matri, I would say. You know, because people were focused, we developed, we we launched a couple of platforms, we launched in GCC market, we had a 
at touch platform that we developed we had an horizontal uh, platform called trip money that we developed we automated a lot of the customer service and so on and so forth so uh, you know and and that was very important and you know and 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 that is what i think is going to now help us as we get out of the pandemic uh, to not only emerge more stronger but also drive the next wave of growth for us so i think that's also very important that uh, one side you keep dealing with the crisis the other side that you love to also uh, sort of uh, strategically think don't lose the path on strategy and execution because these cycles would come and go we have to build capabilities we have to build playbooks for us to be able to deal with those crises and there are many learnings by the way you know i would say with all the humility in my command um there are many learnings and many discoveries that happen along the way so it's not that you know it all you know as you get into it along the way you will see many learnings and discoveries all what you need to do is to make sure that you grab those learnings and then keep making um sort of corrections wherever they need to be uh, made right so that's how sort of the journey starts but i think it's an interesting one uh, from our point of view when i look back when i was dealing with that kind of a crisis back in 2000 and when one was in the uh, in the middle of this massive crisis and then how were we sort of uh, you know how was the journey it was pretty interesting so i guess now uh, quickly moving on to um in the interest of time talking about you know what could be the potential impact of uh, this pandemic to travel and tourism industry given that it has been massively hit as uh, as we all know i i'll tell you our view um you know our our view even in the middle of pandemic from a long term standpoint with respect to the impact on the, uh, travel and tourism industry did not change so our belief our view that travel industry will bounce back uh, and consumers would be out there and experiencing and traveling etc in no time uh, did not change back then and it got proved after wave 1 when the recovery started to happen we saw massive revenge tourism uh, that happened and and the reason for that is very simple at some level it's if you think about it uh if you you would realize that the public memory is so damn short that they just completely forget about you know as soon as the fear of because of the vaccination the fear was uh gone or was slowly going even after during wave 1 and you know and there was at some level stupidity we were lowering our guard massively but that's how we are like as human beings because and it's not necessarily in india i have seen rest of the world was also being on the on the street and trying to go to the pubs and lowering the guard and and doing demonstrations and saying that listen you know we we want to be out we've been fatigued you know, within the the you know four walls of of houses etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's just the inherent sort of need of people to socialize it's the inherent need of people to go out and experience it's the inherent need uh for people to take breaks and so on so so absolutely no change in um, in our view from a long term standpoint of course there are there's when there is a down cycle there is a, you know there will be impact short term as we have seen in the recent past we will see probably uh, sometime more uh but you know maybe 6 months down the line um or a couple of quarters down the line industry should be back on track uh, as people would be traveling as we've seen not only after wave 1 but also after wave 2 even after omicron within 7 days the the flown traffic was coming back like a hockey stick growth uh, curve so that hasn't really changed um in fact consumer behavior might initially uh, would be that you know people are taking more trips because they have really been um you know sitting uh, at home uh, and and not only that you know and, and given the fact that there is hybrid uh, uh, working environment right now people are working virtually some people are working from office but not necessarily 100% of the people are going back to office so you have that flexibility uh, to be able to sort of go out and and during the day work virtually and then you know sort of uh, uh you know have a break during the weekend and stuff right so uh i think it's just uh, it's just going to come back and come back with vengeance and we are already seeing it um the the important part is that you know and i think it is the the interesting uh, sort of learning for the industry um 
you know the our industry not necessarily in you know not our model not make my trip because make my trip actually happens to be a technology business as we all know because we are online travel company uh, and our focus has always been more leveraging technology to provide solutions and provide service and uh, to all our customers and you know keep doing sort of a lot of innovative work on mm, product offerings on across the uh, the platforms whether it is you know mobile app or mobile web or desktop uh, you know big screen sort of uh, platform uh, and keep coming up with innovative uh, uh, products all the time um and and you know we happen to be in a fascinating sort of uh, space called travel um but uh, i guess the rest of the industry especially in the hospitality industry um i think the interesting learning was that they they also started taking technology very seriously uh because i'm not sure that you know the adoption of technology as we've been pushing really really hard working with the partners and and giving them access to our technology that we built it for them um but from from the other side uh, you would want much more sort of aggressive adoption of technology and i think that has been the greatest learning for the for the industry and i think they are all sort of uh, looking ahead uh and now uh, for better times so i guess i'll probably stop at this um by saying that um you know we we are quite excited having come out of the pandemic right now gone through the challenges all sort of people related challenges you know the during the wave two it was it was quite uh disturbing as we all know because you know um it was pretty lethal uh, the infrastructure was failing as far as health infrastructure was concerned having gone through all those kind of challenges from a business standpoint i i think we are proud to say that we did a reasonably good job of declaring actually 5 out of 8 quarters as profitable and now looking forward to the next phase of growth uh, very very excited the team is actually quite excited um, and and almost sort of raring to go uh looking forward to see the better times ahead and so is is our industry overall right so um looking forward i guess um uh, you know from from a uh, you standpoint from your standpoint when you look at starting the career uh you know many options in the in, in india today are sort of open uh just think through more from a long term standpoint um and 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 in a balanced sort of way you know one of the things in and before i before i absolutely shut up i'll tell you it is very important for this group uh one of the things uh, i i wanted to say that i just recalled during the the pandemic we saw as we were going through the crisis a lot of people started to jump ship as well you know uh, and what was heartening really uh, was that we had uh, also people coming back and and you know for the second inning in uh, in at make my trip Because, and the learning there was in fact right now we are just doing a campaign of celebrating the second inning of the people who have just come back and joined um in our organization i think the learning uh, there was as as you talk to people and a lot of people would would talk about it i think it's important one for you all um from as you start to think about career planning uh, i think it's just important to sort of look at more from a long term standpoint uh because the examples that we saw were that people tend to to jump ship just as a panic reaction sometimes without really thinking through but unfortunately land at a place which is not that great either from a culture standpoint or from a profile standpoint because you end up taking the the call in a in a hasty manner uh, and and sometimes that doesn't really work out and we as an organization have been very welcoming especially for the high performers and people who have, who would have left at a good note had great attitude etc to also come back and the doors are open because you know as as you build your career as you grow in um experience etc we all have made mistakes and everybody makes mistakes right so that's really not an issue but i think it i i i thought i will just share that learning with you um that if one is thinking about building the career and picking choices the the onus is on you and the decision is with you but i think it should be thought through more from a longer long term journey standpoint rather than just thinking very very short term and quick all right i guess i'm going to stop at this and i don't know if we have a q and a session or if there are any questions um otherwise
I don't know. I'm back to the operator. Thank you, Rajesh, Rajesh sir, for giving us an insight and a deep dive into the journey of Make My Trip and also the learnings that you have taken in this unprecedented times. And we have a few questions on the chat. Can we take one question if that's okay with you? Sure, sure. Happy to. So the question goes, uh, having a correct feedback loop is one of the most important things in the startups, but it is easier said than done. So in case of any setback, how did you uh, use to analyze that situation and get a proper feedback from various stakeholders? I think it's a great question, uh, a great thought and a great question. Uh, it is imperative. It is an absolute imperative for us to stay connected with the customers. And here stakeholders are mostly customers. And if you are in a B2B business, of course, your customers will become the corporates. And if you are an intermediary, then you also uh, have another set of uh, sort of call them customer, call them partners on the supply side. I, it is imperative for, or for us to stay connected and keep taking feedback. I mean, collecting the feedback is not difficult at all. You know, and there are, you know, you can do online surveys, you can actually talk to them. And many times we encourage people to, to actually talk a handful of customers, to keep collecting insights all the time. And you know, in the, in the digital world, when you release the feature, uh, you actually immediately start to so, sort of uh, take the feedback. Um, and not only that, over the years, you would learn that you are being proactive about, um, you know, testing the, uh, the feature before the release uh, with, with a focus group, right? So just collect the feedback because, you know, so the, I'll tell you the most important thing that, um, that happens in this process. We are all... Um, the, the team who's sort of on the job of working on a particular feature or a product development were very, very close. It is very important, close to the, to the action, right? So it's very important for fresh pair of eyes, unbiased and a neutral pair of eyes, looking at you and giving you constructive feedback, right? So, you know, I think you figure out a way, I think the process of collecting feedback is absolutely not a problem. Analyzing it, uh, is is a critical and sometimes you know um, one of the problems I think that's avoidable sometimes what happens is that people who are building it can get defensive about it and ignore a very important and a critical feedback that's coming back and that is I think you know we should it's it's highly avoidable because the whole purpose of collecting feedback is that you want to hear the other uh, point of view, like, uh, you know, in a, in a focus group with the, from your customers or partners or suppliers, etc. Uh, uh, and, and you have to take it very seriously. So you have to have a process inside and also set up a culture, because it's not a reflection, right on anyone. It's actually interesting trivia. If it is coming back, it is all all what what you need to do is to make sure that uh, take that seriously, if it is consistent, if it is like an anecdote thing, maybe that could be possibly ignored. Uh, but then you need to do it. You know, a concept, uh, a very important sort of concept in the digital world always is to do an A-B um, experiment. Very simple. You know, sometimes uh, you would, uh, you know, on, on a certain percentage of traffic, you would release a particular feature um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, without that, right? So just absolute classical A-B uh, experiments that you can do it. And I think it's just a very standard norm these days. But the, the thought of collecting feedback as well as uh, uh, analyzing feedback is absolutely very, very critical. Uh, thank you so much, Rajesh, sir. So due to paucity of time, I think we have to stop this session here. Absolutely. All right. All the best, everyone. Thank, thank you so much for taking your time on a Sunday morning. No problem. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.
Yeah, hi guys, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Sanju sir, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry, we are facing some uh, Wi-Fi issues, so I hope uh, this it's more clearer from this place. Yes, yes, it is clear. So if it's okay with you, we have a small intro prepared, so can I go ahead with that? Okay, superb. And uh, how long do you want me to talk? That is uh, something uh, they have not uh, told me. Uh, so, ideal time would be uh, 15 to 20 minutes, so wh whatever suits you. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the, our second speaker for the day is uh, Sanjeev Bajaj. And Sanjeev Bajaj, sir, is a joint chairman and MD of Bajaj Capital, which is India's premier investment services company since 1965. Mr. Bajaj is a prominent figure in Indian personal finance. He's, success he's a successful investor entrepreneur, business coach, and a host of Fantastic Talks with Sanjeev Bajaj. It is one of the most India's most watched financial talk shows. Over 6 lakh unique viewers and 10 lakh plus registrations make the show one of the most watched for any investment show. Many notable speakers have appeared on the Fantastic Talks, including Nilesh Shah, A. Balasubramanyam, and Vibha Padalkar. Mr. Bajaj founded the International College of Financial Planning the country's leading institute for financial services education, which wrote and built the CFP curriculum in India. Since 2002, ICOFP has trained 20,000 plus industry professionals and helped build the Indian CFP profession as over 80% of the qualified CFPs in India have studied there. He's a well-known angel investor, mentor, coach for startups, avid writer, and media personality. In addition, Fortune India magazine ranked Mr. Bajaj as 76th in India's top 100 angel investors list. He is a member of many industry bodies such as CIA National Committee on Life Insurance and Pensions and the CIA National Committee on Health Insurance. With his passion for customer-centric life insurance and health insurance products, he has helped build many of the industry's best products. Over to you, sir, for taking the session ahead. Yeah. Thank you for the amazing introduction and it's good to be talking to all of you. I hope I can add value to your lives and I'm quite excited to be here. You, go, you All of you have managed to get into one of India's most premier educational institutions. Now, but this is just the first start. You know, when we are studying, we think, you know, let me get into an amazing place. Let me have an amazing education. And that's it. You know, I've done it. I've achieved it. I've made it there. But at the end of the day, this is just the start. You know, this is where you start. And, uh, you know, when you want to go to the next level, you know, the, the, then that's the where the challenge starts. That, uh, you know, now the decision on most of you would be whether I go and join a corporate or do I get into a startup world? You know, what is the right way forward for me? Do I do my own and I, I'm sure in almost 90% of you, you have that 20, that bug in you that, look, I want to do the startup because India is seeing one of the most amazing startup booms. Now, the big question is, when do I do it? Do we do it right now? Or do we do it after a couple of years or after four or five years when I've had, uh, you know, a little bit more of uh, experience and how would that experience help me uh, in my startup journey? And uh, if I choose to be a professional, then what is the right way forward for me? So guys, I know there are a lot of these questions and a lot of things that will be going through your mind. But let me just try to answer a few because there's never a right answer or there's never a wrong answer. Because life is like a river, it'll find a way. And, uh, and if you try to be very, very clear that look, I just want to do this, I just want to do that, then you become like a lake. That means you're stuck. So guys, so please learn to flow in life. Please learn to be like a river. Please learn to be like a current in the sea, that which is always moving forward, moving around, trying to make a way. So don't be, so you know, my first thing I like to say, okay, look, in life, if you want to achieve something, don't have any fixed mindset. Learn to open your mind, okay? Because if you're if you're if you're stuck in something, then you're not going to move forward. 
ठीक है एंड सो दैट इज द फर्स्ट थिंग दैट वी ओपन ठीक है सो एट द एंड ऑफ द डे सी नो बडी नोज वॉट इज गोइंग टू वर्क वॉट इज नॉट गोइंग टू वर्क एंड यू नो एस दे से लाइफ इन सक्सेस इज नाइंटी नाइन परसेंट हार्ड वर्क एंड वन परसेंट लक सो दैट वन परसेंट लक यू कैन सी इट ठीक है एंड इफ यू आर नॉट ओपन टू चॉइसिस then then maybe you don't you won't see that 1% luck like there is just this story i if you, i don't know if you have heard it or not it's it's in the ancient mythology mythologies of india that there's this guy who was very pious and he used to pray to god every year matlab every day and uh, one time there was a flood and he was drowning theek hai and uh, you know so, and he said god save me god save me and suddenly you know there was a boat which was about 100 meters away and they are calling out to him he swim here swim here swim here and he, and he looks at the boat and he decides not to swim and he he just keeps saying bhagwan mujhe bacha lo god save me god save me god save me and uh, you know eventually he drowns and then he goes up to the heaven and he asks god ki god i have been praying every day i have been pious i have done everything why didn't you save me He said, "I was sitting in the boat. I was calling you to come and swim to me." So point is that look, you have to be open to things. You can't see how luck is coming, going to come to your way. So that is my first message to you: okay, guys, be open. Now the second is that look, if you want something, you have to give something. So learn to be grateful. Now today you have joined one of the best institutions in the country to study. So be be grateful to your professors. Be grateful to your parents. Okay, love comes from being grateful. Like suppose you have a girlfriend or your the girlfriend has you as a boyfriend. If you are not grateful that for that person, that you know the love is not going to prosper. So please understand, learn to appreciate in things in life. Things don't have to be perfect, but you know everybody is playing a small part in our growth in our journey. and if we learn to be grateful it makes our life much much more better and much more interesting so second friends learn to be grateful for what you have yes it doesn't have to be 100% but always be grateful for what you have be thankful be respectful and and that's that's the humbleness you know is what opens the doors for you that when you are grateful you are humble that that's what opens the door for you now the third thing i want to say is that look you will always be you but there must be a second version of you which is your investments theek hai which is you can call it a mini me or a second me and that has to be your business so i would recommend to all of you to look at your investments as a second you and a business that you all are running and don't delay to start that business even if you come from the most challenging backgrounds put a small amount of money theek hai aim is that one day you will make a second corpus which can afford to you know or which pays you more than what you earn for yourself and you know for me this is very very important and this will not happen by saying ki yaar main apni savings i keep it in the bank or i keep money aside or i just buy an fd or i just buy an equity or i just buy a you know a mutual fund it's not going to happen that with that it's going to happen that you have to have a plan because as they say that if you want to reach a destination you need to first define the destination if there is a guy who walks out of the house and says i want to reach somewhere and i have seen so many people like that ke look i want to go somewhere i want to reach somewhere i say okay where do you want to reach what do you want to do that i don't know so if you don't know when you get out of your high house whether you are planning to go to gurgaon you are planning to go to jaipur you are planning to go to bombay or you are planning to go to new york you are not going to reach there so first thing is defining your destination and for investments the destination needs to be building a second income or a passive income which is going to be could be first step should be that this passive income should be equal to my regular income in future if i am going to be earning a 1 crore rupees of regular income then i must have a passive income of building a 1 crore rupees and then you look at it like a business so your investments are not a side thing that you do on side but it's a business you do where you take a very calculative 
steps that look, where do I invest? How do I invest? How much risk do I take? How much risk do I, okay, can I afford to take? Okay, so, so you have to do it like a business. In fact, I met a person very young. You, I do a lot of angel investing. So I do invest and mentor with a lot of the entrepreneurs like you. And I wish that uh, in future, some of you would uh, be entrepreneurs and do some interesting stuff. And I will answer that question. When is the right time to do it? But, uh, and, uh, but so point is that, uh, so I was sharing that story that, you know, I saw this very young guy, 28 year old, not from a great background, but he had made a lot of uh, these uh, of startup investing. So I asked him, I said, look, isn't that an exceptional amount of a risk? Because even when I tell anybody that, look, uh, you know, when you're making this investment, you have to be very careful and you should not do more than five, 10% of your corpus and this thing. So he tells me, okay, you know, sir, I wanted, you know, I am at a level where I have to take a risk to get what I want. So he's saying that, you know, the younger you are, according to me, the higher risk you can take. He's saying, today I'm earning, I bought my insurance, so I'm covered. So my family is covered. Beyond that, I don't have any money to be conservative with. So for me, I would put every money, every dime I have into high risk assets so that I can get high returns. You know, so he says, my, my aim is to be picking up the right companies, picking up the right uh, uh, you know, gatherings, um, you know, picking up the right focus, being very clear where I want to go. And, you know, I'm quite amazed with that person that when I look at the person analytic capabilities, ability, and when you become so good at one thing, okay, there is success. So the, recently that person got a job within one of the very good funds in US and where the person has the right to be making his own investments because the person had been so passionate about what he had been doing. So guys, this was my, this is the third is that build a second income, treat it like a, uh, like a business. And that's where, that's where Bajaj Capital comes in that, you know, at Bajaj Capital, our focus has been helping people build a second income. A lot of people don't know things like fixed deposits, uh, systematic investment plans, ETC, ETC were born at Bajaj Capital. But the challenge is that we are 58 years old, but we have to be as nimble as the current day startup and we have to be as tech savvy. And that's the cha our current challenge that we are, uh, we are facing and we are fighting that how do we be nimble? How do we attract the best talent? And I'm so happy to have uh, so many of your alums who are working with us, so many alums from other, and this is what makes us this thing, makes us great. And final friends that don't think knowledge is equal to success. I know whenever I ask youngsters that what will get me success, this is a knowledge, but then every engineer would have been a success. Every MBA would have been a success. Knowledge is not equal to success. There is a thing in between that between knowledge and success, it is called the belief. Like I shared the story of this person. He had a belief that I can pick winners. I can, uh, you know, take out great uh, returns. He had already made a very good amount of money on startup investing, where he used to go visit, support, mentor, work uh, with these companies. And he's, then he believes that today I have done so much work on this area that I can spot a winner. So when you convert your knowledge into belief by practice, 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 that's where you're going to have the success. So guys, learn to practice in life. Like, you know, all of you must have your aced your entrance exams or aced your maths and other things. And you, have, you would have realized that this only happens when you practice and you keep practicing. So guys, knowledge is not equal to success, but knowledge when practiced, and you have the belief I can do it is equal to success. And finally, the question I posed, when is it the right time to do it? I had shared an example that you can't see luck. Okay? Actually, that's not true. You can see luck. Okay? So, you know, the, my father has a saying that you can see luck. All of you would have heard the story of Mahabharata. In Mahabharata, who's the most pious and the most, uh, you know, the honest person? And a lot of people will say Yudhishthir, Arjun, 
but the right answer is that it's it's bhishma pitama he has never done anything on wrong in his life but the guy is not a hero of the mahabharata he is virtually on the sides of the villain so because he chose the wrong side so the, the success friends is choosing the right side so when they say so whenever you find the right people is the right time to do the startup okay so when you have the right idea you have the right uh, couple of friends who want to do it together and you believe you have an amazing idea or you think you can crack a problem or or you know you get a right job you know and because if you get a chance to work for a good honest company then even that is good because today startup doesn't mean that you have to do it yourself you can also be working in a company which has an aim of giving you esops and there's a lot of wealth to be created there and in fact given the, the fact that the startup boom maybe uh, you know going to face a dent in the future with what is happening in ukraine and the over bloat that had happened in the startup world there may be some corrections so it may make sense to work with larger organizations which have a higher survivability chance where you get a nice esop so there is a lot of wealth to be created and uh, you guys are some of the smartest brains so wishing you all the best and i hope my talk on this sunday morning is able to add a little value to your life so guys please go ahead do it build a second income be open be grateful and be successful thank you thank you so much uh, sanjeev sir so we have a few questions from the batch in the chat so can i go ahead with them yeah please so rit is uh, is an up and uh, coming financial instrument in india that allows us to directly invest in real estate with the liquidity and safety of regulatory oversight what do you think about such an instrument for investing in a place of direct real estate yeah yeah rate is a fantastic uh, investment i i on personally feel and i would rather keep my money in a reit than uh, to keep my money in a fixed deposit with a bank where i end up paying 30% tax and here this is much more tax efficient than that i can uh, if i'm lucky most of these reit coupons are in the range of 7% 8% and uh, plus there is an upside chance also but we must also remember there is a chance of downside also so you know that rate can fluctuate in plus minus 20% now that's where the little bit of the risk comes in because you know this is listed on the stock market and sometimes stock market prices assets in an irrational manner so you know it is not your fault but it goes up by 20% so if you are on the right ride up up your money went up by 20% you'll be more than happy but if there is a correction because it was overpriced and it goes down by 20% then it'll take you 3 years to break even so you guys have to be slightly uh, uh, you know careful of that but reits are a very good instrument and with the right foresight and a right research if you are able to get into the right tree it's it's a great asset to have i know they have been slightly pressurized due to covid that offices are not going to open up or this is and there are a lot of companies but most of people have now realized to get the kind of efficiency in the work that you require you need to have an office and you need to be together so this work from home culture is actually getting reduced now and i think so eventual office spaces are going to have a high demand but uh, we also have to keep in mind that these are risky instruments in the sense that uh, they are affected by the kind of capacity and the supply that is coming but overall i think reit is a great asset for a person to be at your age or any uh, any age for a person to be able to invest into high quality real estate which otherwise he won't have had an access to thank you so much for that sir and we have another question so investing in direct equities provide greater returns but it also exposes one to speculative trading which results in most person losing money in the end game what is your advice to a common youth while investing in equities yeah guys one is it's a fallacy that investing in direct return will get you greater return how it doesn't because the, you know you are investing into a direct equity it goes up by 30% it goes up by 30% you invest through a mutual fund okay and at the end of the day it goes up by 30% you still get 28% so please understand that even if mutual fund is charging you something it's a small amount of money and it depends on your corpus 
So imagine your corpus is even 10 lakh rupees and you are paying 2% management fees on it. So how much, how much of it, how much would it be? All of you are mass genius. What is 2% on a 10 lakh rupees? It's 20,000 rupees? Yes. So is for a 20,000 rupees, imagine a person like you with maybe 10 years experience trying to do get the right investments for you, having another team of seven, eight people like you. So you are getting a team which is getting paid crores of rupees to manage money for you, to find spotters for you. Their bonuses, growth, in life all depend on being able to beat that 30 percent mark which is the index mark so if they are able to give a return of 36 38 people are looking at quant people so today they are very innovative funds so i think they are a better way of going at it so direct equity guys only if you want to buy and hold should you do direct equities or you want to do it like a full-time business if you do equities as a part-time you will lose money because at the end of the day, guys, even I lose money because I forget because I get so busy in a project and it is an option between me. Oh, I have some open positions. Do I concentrate on that or do I concentrate on my business? You know, for me, my choice will always be concentrate on my business and I will end up losing money, but I, which I do it for the sake of fun and just to keep myself active that I know how to take future and, and option calls and I have to do that. So I have, just to see, just to remain updated with what's happening in the market. But guys, I will tell you, please don't try to do that. Please try to get the best of the best fund manager, you know, spend that time working with a wealth management firm with a good research capability to find the India's or the world's best fund managers who will do a great job for you. Like I personally on the international equities follow Motley Fool. And, you know, they have some great funds. They have great some stocks, but they are able to pick out a lot of winners, the kind of effort, energy that is going in there. If I can, you know, plug into that effort and energy, why not? And guys, friendly, frankly, wealth is created by being a passive investor. As an active investor, then it's your business. So as a passive investor, it's better to go through mutual funds. But your aim is to be able to find the right fund who are doing something innovative and something different. Like example is that there's a fund called Quant. So whenever their strategy works, it's a small fund, but their performance is much better so they are, you know, adding quantitative analysis to stock selection. So at the end of the day, they have been able to show that they have been able to do well. Or there was a fund that you would have not heard of, Parag Parekh Financial Services, which created this whole category of multi-asset funds. Now, because they were innovative, they were young, they said, look, we are going to create a global portfolio. We are not only going to have Indian winners, but we are going to have 30% or 20% of our money in our global winners. And they ended up investing in companies like Microsoft, Apple, much, I'm talking about this is much, much ago, ago, and they were able to deliver much more fantastic returns than any other Indian fund. So it's being able to select these right winners that is going to get you returns. So there are these fantastic talks are good. We have 23 of India's top fund managers or wealth managers that we have covered. See it, uh, you know, listen to it, see what they think, what is their methodology, what, what you know, what they are all about. Sure, sir. We'll definitely tune into that. And thank you so much for giving your time on a Sunday morning and also giving us an insight on alternative investments and the risks that we need to take to achieve higher returns like you mentioned yeah thank you guys it's great pleasure to be with all of you wishing you all the best and uh, i look forward to a few of you working with us so great and wishing you all the best thank you so much yeah thank you bye
హాయ్ గారు హాయ్ కెన్ యు హెల్ప్ మీ బై కెన్ యూ స్టార్ట్ యా వి కెన్ స్టార్ట్ ఎస్ ఎస్ సో వి హావ్ అ స్మాల్ ఇంట్రో ప్రిపేర్డ్ సో ఐ విల్ జస్ట్ గో హెడ్ విత్ ద ఇంట్రో యా uh uh good uh, good afternoon everyone so our next speaker in our talk series uh, is uh, mr gaurav malhotra uh, he is our own very uh, own alumnus who is a current senior vice president at city bank he is an engineering graduate from netaji subhash chandra bose institute of technology where he majored in information technology post that he did his mba from fms delhi He is a seasoned banker who has worked in relationship management, corporate finance and structured trade for over a decade. He has frontline experience with different exposure to clients ranging from big market to large corporations. He has proven able uh, he has proven ability to thrive in high pressure environments and deliver award winning results in the uh, origination and execution of structured debt transactions. Over to you Gaurav. You can take the session here. thank you very much and i just like to start off with a little bit of music okay so for those of you who don't know this was the theme of uh, the empire strikes back uh, from star wars uh, why i chose this was because different as uh, you may have heard from the various stalwarts of the entrepreneurship uh genre uh before me or after me you will hear from them i come from a very different background and the perspective that i wanted to bring to this uh, discussion was uh while entrepreneurship uh fintechs and the likes the startups are bringing a sea change uh to the way the big businesses or the big banks are working uh there is a huge change which is being brought about in the way we work uh we i have been through uh, 13 years in this industry now and the way we are responding to the challenges being brought forth by these startups is mind boggling you you uh, the way i used to work 13 years when i jo- uh, joined the bank and the way we work now it's completely different and uh, that that's what i wanted to uh, discuss and this is not just relevant to the fintech industry which i will talk about this has been evident for the past 20 25 years for example in the entertainment industry where in you used to have a single channel then it became a bundle of channels through the cable network then it became otts and all those sorts uh, the media industry the ads industry every industry that we talk about has gone through this bundling and unbundling and which has brought a sea change on how we are looking at uh, uh, these the way the way they function now uh i'll just start one second can you see my screen yes you can see it now okay so the uh, so i'll take this example of how the unbundling of big businesses and this uh, uh relaying it through a fintech versus a bank perspective now in the indian jungles uh, you would know that tiger is a prime predator right and it's afraid of not a single animal except one which is uh, an animal which is 16 or 17th in size uh, which are uh, do- they are called doles or wild dogs because even if they are so smaller uh, compared to the tiger each animal in the pack performs its own uh, function specialized function and through which they can bring even a tiger down uh and that's that's the perspective that i wanted to bring that for if you bring specialization into something a pack of it can you can really bring a, a big change now during 2006 uh, 2008 financial crisis many institutions were classified as too big to fail uh they were behemoths offering a large amount of services a plethora of services and the governments believed that they if they let them fail it would lead to collapse of the financial system as a whole that was a watershed moment which started off the unbundling of big business wherein people thought that this 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 big behemoths need to change uh 
the unbundling and modularization, these two words you would hear from me ad nauseum over the next 10, 15 minutes. And hopefully through uh, this presentation or this discussion, I'll be able to bring forth the view that fintechs have brought about a sea change in not just how consumers uh, are looking at the businesses, but also how the incumbents are responding to it. Okay, now what is unbundling? And uh, it's been famously said, as you can see on the screen, that the uh, only way to make money is unbundling and unbundling and then uh, bundling again. It's a vicious or a non-vicious cycle, however uh, you may see it, and the internet is uh, driving both. Now, in the past, people used to uh, have one bank for most of their financial services needs. Uh, and this is not, this is true, I think about 15 years back as well. They often had a single long-standing relationship uh, through which they got almost all of their financial needs serviced. However, and people were famously uh, said to have uh, to more likely to divorce than to change their bank. However, today consumer preferences have completely changed. They may have current accounts with two or three banks, uh, personal loans with two others, credit cards with three or four banks, mortgages with another, an investment portfolio with either all of them or with none of them. This is as a result, customers are able to increasingly assemble their own personal financial suites of uh, products and services both. And this is configured to suit their own uh, specific diverse set or simply, I think it may be because they just might like a brand uh, for some reason. And the other important part to note is that these can easily be the products and services, the toolkit that a customer has uh, built for itself. It is easily, it can easily be swapped over time as cheaper or better options uh, come about. Unbundling has truly put the custom back in the customer and this should be beneficial for uh, consumers by allowing more choice. And in tandem, the point to note is that this will exacerbate competition pressure uh, on the providers and uh, force them to offer better value. Now, what is unbundling in reality? And this is this can you can see uh, on your screen. Bank of America, I'm taking an example of Bank of America, but this is true for each and every bank on the street and how they are responding to it. If you see, Bank of America used to offer all these services standalone over the past, uh, let's say, not more than 15 to 20 years ago. For each of the service lines that you're seeing on screen, there are myriad of startups that are offering the same service. Now, what this means is that they each and every part of the bank is becoming disassembled into various different smaller and sharper parts. I'll first take the example. So the upper part of the slide shows to you what is product modularization because each and every entity is offering us product and the bottom part tells you the process modularization. Now, uh, with tech capabilities growing, I think, uh, and barriers to entry falling, large number of highly specialized companies are emerging which offer a specific part of a banking value chain. And it's akin to, I think, a Cambrian explosion wherein life forms became abundant on earth. And it's similar thing which is happening to startups in the fintech space. And thanks to this is due to the singular focus in cutting edge technology, these startups are able to create solution that traditional service providers like banks struggle to match simply because they're spread across a wide range of products and locked into legacy tech stacks, which are very difficult uh, to change. And as people get more options, they increasingly pick and choose multiple service providers that fit their needs. Uh, this, this unbundling of consumer offering is what we mean by financial products being disassembled. And similarly, I think uh, uh, process modernization, as you can see at the bank, so these B2B fintechs uh, are playing out at the back end of financial services. The value chain is becoming increasingly uh, smaller, specialized and uh, uh, a lot of startups offering or fintechs offering a similar experience to uh, the back end of financial services. 
traditionally banks have done everything in house so they had uh, developed their own back end process centers they had vertically integrated to ensure everything was uh, done in house however now a growing number of processes are using a b2b uh, fintech providers which offer specialized and sophisticated and better solutions these service providers are coming across in each and every link of the banking value chain and you may be interacting with these uh, vertically integrated fintechs into the banking value chain and you may not have even realized it for example chatbots uh, your credit scoring your customer identification all of these services are being done by fintechs which are integrated into the banking value chain and this is far more pronounced in uh, advanced economies versus emerging ones but it's getting there you uh, in emerging economies and developing economies it's getting there now what does this mean for incumbents and that is that that's the question that i would be discussing and what how i am responding as a bank uh, to the fintechs coming over in my space in offering the products that i offer in offering the services that the banks offer and given the scale of depth of these competitive forces which are uh, coming about what does the future future hold for them will banks or let's say the incumbents inevitably succumb to uh, unbundling and see the many tightly interconnected links of their value chain being picked off one by one by digital challengers uh, which offer uh, superior tech and have laser focus on that specific part will they be overrun by banks uh, which have a very different operational model customer metrics and engagement standards for example the neo banks that you are seeing uh, in india jupiter and their likes or will they weather the storm by virtue simply by virtue of their resources their experience their long standing relationships that they have already developed with customers over the past 15 20 years long enough to successfully adopt the tools and strategies of these specific challengers and prevail uh, henceforth we consider three possible scenarios and what they would mean for incumbents in general so the first scenario uh, is uh, rejuvenation this is the most conservative scenario from our perspective and uh, let's assume the fintech service providers are able to rejuvenate themselves and remain dominant they might do simply by transforming their existing businesses as for example dbs has done in singapore and it's become a fully digital bank they might launch smaller digitally native flanker brands for example uh, chase by jp morgan marcus by goldman sachs or they might simply buy these digital challengers on account of the uh, sheer size of their balance sheets simply put banks know what they are talking about they with their level of expertise they can apply vetted technologies onto their legacy stacks to come out with tailored solutions for their processes and keep offering better value to end consumers challenger banks might be the answer to stagnation in traditional banking and using the best of these worlds uh, flanker brands plus digital tech they might remain relevant uh you might be aware or if you're not the banks are legacy banks are offering or uh, implementing immense amounts of money in analytics and data science which are offering better solutions to customers right now they may be moving slow but the goal is to retain competitive advantage with uh, these services do remember bigger vessels are harder to maneuver however they are harder to replace as well and i think it's honestly it's revenge time for some incumbent banks they have taken longer to reinvent their services especially in uh, through digital transformation and the ux that they offer but once they are there uh, they can very well compete with the fintech startups scenario 2 and uh, this is this is uh, maybe because incumbents are just aren't able to keep up with the pace of innovation that smaller startups offer digital transformation projects that these banks have invested so heavily on may not yield the results that we have been talking about and the flanker brand initiatives that i spoke about work uh, may be may have been implemented but are hampered because they uh, the banks have legacy mindsets and processes 
or simply they are too late to the market. And meanwhile, these challenger brands and the new fintech offerings, uh, they have the huge investment from the venture capital and IPOs, which enable them to stave off any acquisition offers from big banks. With a combination of superior product, uh, better price and user experience, the challengers rapidly take over market share from the bank and are replaced. And this is scenario three, uh, the most likely scenario. And uh, you would have heard this story uh, when you were growing up, right? Two cats fighting and the monkey taking all the cake. Uh, the third scenario, wherein incumbents and these challengers, the fintechs, are alike are disintermediated by big tech platforms like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, WeChat, Uber, Grab. All of these entities, what do they think? What do you think are right now? They all of them would like to be classified as fintechs. They are investing huge amounts of money in coming into the fintech space because that's where uh, they will make money. Neither old or the new uh, fintechs can match the UX design, the machine learning, the data, and the sheer resources of these big tech companies. They create vast ecosystems of uh, financial service providers. So what will happen is financial service providers will have offer specialized services through their AI powered personal financial assistance and uh, fintechs will compete by providing being uh, wanting to be part of that ecosystem. Banks, on the other hand, would be relegated to being back end service providers of balance sheet and underwriting those specific products that these uh, big tech firms are offering to their consumers, which will mean that the banks are just a way for big tech firms to remain relevant in the banking space and rules and regulations. So they would do all the fancy work upfront on the front end and banks would be dealing with the regulations and the back end processes, which they uh, were first trying to change by themselves. Now, how worried should be uh, incumbents be about big tech? And I'm not talking about crypto here. It's uh, it, it was a famous quote by John Bakersfield, uh, who said that the company that owns the customer attention is the only one that matters. And every other company in the value chain would become uh, commoditized and dependent. Big tech platforms like Google, Amazon, we talk, uh, spoke about a while back, have significant assets that can bring on financial services, uh, including large user bases, vast amounts of data, sophisticated tech, and the most important, strong design skills. These players are making immense amounts of investments in automation, AI, and which would bring uh, chatbots, voice-based interfaces, uh, image recognition, and the likes. And this would make uh, this would make uh, them the best place to be become pers your personal financial assistant uh, that sits between you and the uh, providers of products like fintechs and banks. They will provide they will uh, insights, projections, recommendations, personalized nudges, and most of all, the seamless experience that we as consumers look at. Pivoting into this space makes the best most sense for these uh, large players especially because they rule the roost when it comes to relationships with end consu uh, consumers and uh, the associated data that comes about. And hence, this scenario seems most likely to happen. The time will come where instead of you and I going to the uh, banks saying that, look, I would like a loan, these front-end companies, these big tech companies uh, would come to you and say, we think it's time uh, for you to take a loan based on the data that we have analyzed. And this would be all thanks to uh, the treasure trove of data that we would have uh, given to them. Uh, lastly, uh, during the global financial crisis in 2008, if you remember during those times, uh, the complete uh, it was a complete collapse of the financial uh, ecosystem. Governments bailed out uh, the very institutions that let the economy down and this spurred a serious rethink of the financial ecosystem. Does it make sense that it takes two days for uh, to settle a stock transaction? Uh, why do retailers who already operate in, on razor-thin margins have to pay 2% or 3% on a credit card transaction? 
why does it take two days to transfer money from uh, one uh, from my bank account to the brokerage why are savings rates so minuscule or negative why is it so difficult for entrepreneurs to get financing at traditional banks one of the biggest draws to the ideas of blockchain technology was to reinvent the financial space uh, and making it permissionless and open to anyone and everyone the further attraction to this is composability which means anyone can mix and match the services which are available on the defi space defi means uh, decentralized finance the composability of such network in defi space effectively what it means is that there are uh, building blocks of interlocking components anyone what the product that they need to offer can combine those interlocking components and bring cutting edge innovations which you may not have seen before and the amount of change that has happened in this space over the last few years is absolutely mind boggling and most of that has simply laid the groundwork for such actual shifts in behavior once such uh, uh, behaviors uh, get deployed earnestly there would be feedback loops which would be operating in for example payments uh in investments in lending and this would spur a, a transformation of the complete uh, landscape in which uh, we are working and impact not just consumers retail consumers like us but companies also uh, that we operate in however uh, i think in my opinion uh, for defi to work the regulatory framework that we are working in completely leads to collapse and if for those of you who've seen a, a show called mr robot where in the financial ecosystem completely fail that's what we are looking at if defi has to win uh, post that finally uh see the fintech world is fast changing and even small regulatory changes have a snowball effect on how these firms operate you you may have seen an example of how the payment processes of for example paytm have changed over the past years on simply on account of one small change in regulations in pay, uh, in uh, loading your wallets etc upi for example financial regulators prior were taking a hands off approach to fintechs because they didn't know how to handle these firms were they tech companies were they finance companies so they were what they did was they ensured that there is a bank at the back end of each and every transaction that these firms do but does that mean that the banks would can prevent these fintechs from encroaching into this space the while the regulators may have ensured that the bank is present for each and every transaction do the banks want to be in that space it's not a very remunerative or role and simply it does not offer any Uh, insight or any ownership of the end consumer see the banks would have to decide whether where they want to be in the finance value chain can they afford to fight for customer primacy do they actually have a more profitable route to market to become a foundation for such big tech firms to stand upon see some banks will choose to do both and we are seeing examples where uh, banks are already fighting it for example some of them are offering their services to amazon uh, to offer to their merchants on the other hand cryptos are facing a watershed moment where their base existence is being threatened uh, by declaring them illegal in many markets will they be viewed so a lot of you or a lot of us have would have made money in the recent run uh, on cryptos uh, over the past couple of years but would they be seen as chit funds scams uh, that used to happen 20 years ago uh, to four or five years down the line does the future belong to banks fintechs or defi and only time will tell uh, in the meantime uh, let's sit back and enjoy the ride thanks uh, thank you so much garo for giving us uh, an insight about banks fintechs and also how big tech firms play a part in that so we have some questions from the batch so can we take that up yeah so uh, i have a question first from uh, madhu gautam uh, it says that in the indian context generally people prefer to land government institutions when it comes to managing their financial products say banks uh, lic but whereas in case of fintechs it is quite opposite where google pay dominates uh, beam app 
what could be the major reasons for hindrance for the beam app and how google pay managed to garner its market share as i said uh, the scenario 3 is playing out live in front of us uh, beam is a fantastic service and banks are using that also in their payment stacks however uh, the U- ux uh, the data that google pay has for example if i have made an electricity payment once through google pay i would get an automatic reminder from that uh, that your uh, payment is due on on month on month basis this is the exact uh, scenario that we are seeing and because of the data the tech the machine learning that they have employed this uh, these firms are winning and what what the regulators and the government has ensured is that by beam is at the back end uh and uh, is they can uh, govern the rules uh, uh, and the ro- uh, rules of the road for beam the front end remains with uh, the startups which offer the best value to consumers second question is uh, growing fintechs uh, applies uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning for better managing uh, customer needs so can this lead to reduced importance of uh, wealth advisors or their abilities skill sets and how synchronization between tech and humans will take place in the future uh so i don't know if you've uh, used any of uh, the services that are being offered by uh, the fintech say for example grow uh, zerodha or uh, robinhood for example these firms offer you customized solutions and these are all uh, their personal financial assistants are nothing but chatbot nothing but uh, uh, ai uh, which is calculating on what my needs would be based on the past investments that i have done it would would it lead to reduced importance of wealth advisors well uh, yes uh, i would say uh, it is actually already playing out uh, there is lesser need for people who are entering into the market who are who grown up with tech a human relationship may not be the way they would want to go so it depends so for example for uh, people in their 40s or 50s who've not seen tech uh, who've not grown up with tech it may still want a uh, warrant a need for the wealth advisors to advise them but for people who've grown up with tech and are comfortable relying on uh, such tech for their other needs may also consider uh, uh, a machine to uh, give them the right answer for their investment needs and uh, if you had to take my opinion on this one i would say yes uh, the customer needs would be better fulfilled in the future by big tech firms offering machine learning and ai uh, for answering these in a very recent move uh, cbse has collaborated with npci to introduce financial literacy to students beginning class 6 as the head of next generation lending tech company oh sorry this is not me i think this is for someone else uh, okay powerful platforms have given uh, digital natives like paypal reach and uh, give uh, towering market caps these platforms raise difficult question for ceos of incumbent fintechs pushing ahead with their own digital transformation so should they emulate the front runners join with them or not play at all so not play at all would mean uh, their end so i don't think that would uh, uh, they would anyone would choose that however uh, so as i said it, it all of these firms are trying to play in an uneven market field if you want to raise uh, or if you how, how many of you spend more time on an investment platform versus a google whatsapp uh, for example if you the as i said the company which owns the customer attention it will eventually win so uh, if your company or a fintech which is offering a customized product or a solution the best way would be for them to join uh, that and offer their services on a larger platform and that's what we are seeing right uh, the coming of age of super apps wherein all the product providers are uh, at the back end and the front end is ruled by a single company 
So that's how the stacks are getting built up in the future. And that's what will offer the best value for these fintechs also to remain relevant in current times. Uh, last question, which says is uh, uh, fintech is the new is fintech the new method of providing financial services industry, or is it a new fintech emerging industry? Is the existing all of the existing names which were tech players previously, uh, Google, Amazon, Amazon was e-commerce, Uber was a, a transport company, all of them are transforming into fintechs because if you rule. Uh, the finance uh, space which offers payment so finance would offer payments lending and investments then you own the customer fully and you can offer your own products as uh, along with that for example i'll give you a very uh, good example jp morgan has tied up with uh, volkswagen for integrating into their payment space what that means is for a Volkswagen car, when it goes to a petrol pump, uh, fills up petrol, it won't have to pay anything. The car, which is linked to the uh, bank account uh, of the customer at the back end, would automatically pay for it. So it's each and every firm is trying to integrate into the uh, space that we have right now. It was, there used to be tech and uh, uh, finance fintechs were two separate industries. However, we've seen an emergence and uh, collaboration between them to the scale that we've not seen before. And all of them will be subsumed in the coming few years. I think we reached the end of the questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Gaurav, for taking your time on a Sunday and giving us an insight into banking industry and finance industry. Thank you. It was a good experience. And thank you for spending your time on a lovely spring afternoon. All the best. Thank you so much. Bye.
Hi, Ruchi. Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, I can't hear you at all. Maybe you're on mute. Hello, uh, can you hear me now? Um, and I'm unable to hear you. Let me just see if there are any setting issues here. Yeah. Can you try increasing the volume on your end? Give me a second. I'm going to just change my headsets or so. Sure. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I still can't hear you. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> mm, let's change something here. Uh, can you check your volume, please? Uh, uh, I can't hear you. Okay. I can only see you speak, but I can't hear you. So I'm just trying to make some setting adjustments here. Hi, could you say something so that I'm... Uh, hi, Ruchi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. I think okay, it's something to do with my headsets. Okay. So how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Very well, thank you. Hope you are having a good Sunday till now. Um, yes, yes, it's been fine. So can you start? Just give me a second. I'm going to use a PPT here. So I just yeah, I mean, we have a small introduction uh, of you. So after I give that, can we we can you can go ahead with the presentation? No, I just want to check whether. It's okay, on. okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just a second. This works, right? You are able to see my screen as well? Yes, uh, we can see the screen. Perfect. So I'll stop sharing and we can get started. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the next speaker in our Innovator Talk series is our very own alumnus, Ms. Ruchi Tushir, 
who is currently the vice president and general manager of Voltus Cluer, JGM India. Her primary goal is to accelerate uh, Voltus Cluer's growth in India through deeper customer insight and opportunity aligned go-to-market structures with a focus on technology products. Truchi is passionate about bringing the value of transformative technology to customers with a focus on transformative technology. So I think you can go ahead, Ruchi, with the presentation. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's always uh, an amazing experience to come back to my alma mater and have, a, have an opportunity to engage with all of you young brains, energetic souls. So I'm literally looking at uh, a very um, interactive as well as you know, energizing conversation this afternoon. Um, when the team from FMS reached out to me, they were very keen that I spend time on some of the, that razor edge technology that of course was also spoken about in my introduction. And I think uh, rightly so, uh, because there's enough and more that's happening and how you know, latest tech is kind of transforming the way uh, businesses, consumer priorities are really changing. And what role do they play in that entire scheme of things? So I'm excited to today talk about AI IoT, a topic that I'm so seriously very passionate about. And after this session, if I'm able to inspire even a one of you to kind of think of some uh, building up something in these set of technologies, I'll be the happiest soul on earth. But with that, let's get started and let me just share my screen so that I use some aids to kind of bring about um, the pointers home. Let me know what you guys are able to see if it is the right PPD on the screen. Yeah, we can see your screen, Richard. Perfect. So, um, you know, when uh, FMS folks reached out to me, they wanted me to talk about um, AI IoT. And traditionally, you know, these have been looked at two separate technologies. But I think we've come a long way from there. Um, the fact that it's not a siloed approach towards looking at AI or an IoT, but it's actually a combination of two, which is going to be seriously helping us do that cutting edge transformation. And it's not restricted to industries, areas which are high tech, but we're talking about you know, literally bringing this home in every aspect of um, you know, scenario that we could think about. But let's just understand what's what's really happening here. And I think um, most of you would have seen, would have even experienced that uh, businesses across the world are adopting IoT now, um, which is Internet of Things, by the way. And um, basically, you know, this IoT scheme of things is helping us collect a tremendous amount of data from a variety of multiple sources. However, you know, wrapping around this multitude of data coming from these countless zillion number of devices, um, there is data. And how do you actually kind of synthesize all that data together to really make an impact on that complexity and translate that complexity into something meaningful for the business? And this is where the future is also moving on, you know, full potential for IoT devices in every scenario of your life, in every scenario of your business. And that's where the investment of now, um, AI, the convergence of AI and IoT together, helping us redefining the way um, industries, businesses, economies would really function. AI-enabled IoT will help us create that intelligent machine that will actually simulate that smart behavior and will help us support the decision that will literally require little to no human intervention, but at the same time, give you the max output that would be relevant for that scenario. So let's first of all understand, you know, what's really changing in the market. So I'm gonna throw some numbers here and, and I'm just wondering, could we make this a little more interactive? Um, and could I ask questions here as well? Uh, I think you can do that. They can answer through the Q and A okay. section. Yeah. yeah. So do I mean this? I'm flashing a number on the screen. Any guesses on what this might be? Eighty billion. Anyone could speak or chat for that matter. Never mind. Let me just 
Help you with one more thing, 40%. Any of this is ringing a bell? Okay, let me make it even more uh, exciting. 42 billion again, and then 22 million. Now these are all numbers flashing on the screen, but let me give you a context on what these numbers mean and what is what does it actually translate into? You know, some of the studies are actually forecasting that the AIoT market could actually be somewhere in the to the tune of 80 billion. That's not a small number. I mean, imagine the um, space and operating space that we have to literally make an impact and literally grow this number. Now that gets even more exciting by the fact that it is growing at a 40% CAGR. So even if I'm projecting it to be 80 billion, the growth path is just amazing. And, and these are just studies, you know, which were done, let's say a couple of years back or maybe last year. Now imagine maybe I'm coming out of COVID. This could even literally burst out and your 80 billions could become into trillions and so on and so forth. But the point that I'm trying to make is the opportunity is huge. 42 billion, we're talking about IoT connected devices as of today, globally. And this is, this is but natural that this 42 billion will take no time to grow into, I don't know what kind of data set here, because we're literally connecting more and more devices with each passing hour, with each passing day. Now I have a number again, 22 million, which is the one which is differently colored. Uh, any guesses what this may be actually? Okay. So while we spoke about the market scenario, which is like so promising, we're still plagued by the fact that um, we do have challenge of skilled workers in this space to make an impact on the market or the growth opportunity that we're talking about. So some of the reports that we hear, and this is specific to India as a number, where we're looking at 22 million workers, which will be required with the right set of skills or upskilling, on AI, IoT, big data, cloud computing, et cetera, to serve the market demand that I just spoke about. Now you can see how much is the growth pattern and where is the scope for us to actually go after. But let's, let's understand this more. You know, while I just gave you these numbers, there are, there are actually reports which say that, you know, while we're looking at billions of, um, um, billions of dollars as market opportunity, I think, there are some folks who are also projecting that companies uh, across the world could actually invest up to 15 trillion in IoT by just 2025. And this is where the belief comes that this offers a potential economic impact of almost 4 trillion to 11 trillion. I mean, I can't go bigger than this. I mean, we're talking about some trillion, wor a trillion dollars worth of opportunity in the market. You guys can just you know, understand how this market is gonna blow up and literally present opportunities, not just for organizations, but for businesses to truly transform themselves. Well, with that, let's uh, also understand, is this resonating with, while well, we see this as an opportunity, is it resonating with where organizations are actually investing in? So this is again a research done by um, SADA systems and they, they're typically trying to understand you know, where is the, latest bend of technology. And if you look at this one, we're actually talking about that organizations are focusing on IoT, AI, ML, and edge computing as their top technologies to be investing in. And, and I mean, these numbers are speaking for themselves. This is about, you know, how are they investing to most increase their efficiency and secondly, have that competitive advantage. So the verdict is clear, the market is there, the direction is there, and organizations are also stepping up to that challenge to start building into this uh, scheme of things. And that's where we come to the fact that, okay, we understand there's enough and more opportunity, but what is this entire AI plus IoT coming together and giving us that lighthouse of innovations? Um, I'll again open it up for any, quest, uh, any responses here. Any guesses of um, AI plus IoT coming together and kind of making a huge impact? Anyone on the team may want to just raise their hand, answer, give any examples here? Okay. Um, now any guesses? Okay, we're talking about Tesla. 
Tesla is the most easiest or you know the most relevant example I'd call out, which is the example of IoT and AI coming together. The power of AI, which is helping them predict the behavior a lot more, which is getting um, you know closer to reality by what IoT devices are feeding in every hour, every minute of the drive that the car is on. Now this is this is what I'm talking about. You know the opportunity is just so amazing. With just Tesla, the overall world's uh, overall capitalization that Tesla may have is nearly US one US dollars one trillion. Imagine the the scheme of things that one could think about, the the growth in the market that one could think about, but just this simple idea of AI and IoT coming together in cars, self-driving cars. The market capitalization is so huge. And if we just open this up for the next level of industries, we're going to breach what I just told you on 80 billion and so and so forth. Um, this is an example which is close to most of our hearts because uh, this always does evoke a lot of emotion when we hear hear one thing or the other around Tesla. But it doesn't stop here. And I think to understand what does AI plus IoT together, AIoT together really uh, mean, I think we need to understand how this truly operates. And I'm not going to, I'm not making it too technical or anything, but just keeping it at a very basic level. At its core, an IoT is just a sensor which is implanted into machines, which is offering us that stream of data through internet connectivity. It is as simple as that. However, every single IoT related service invariably will follow the five basic steps, which is called creating, which is called communicating, which is called aggregating, and then analyzing and subsequently doing the action. Now, undeniably, the value of the act or the action depends upon the penultimate analysis. Um, hence, the precise value of IoT will actually be determined at its analyzed step. And this is where the AI technology portrays a very, very critical element. Um, while AI, AI, IoT is providing data, artificial intelligence acquires the power to unlock responses, offering both creativity as well as context to drive those smart actions. And you know, as the data which is being delivered from the sensor um, that can be analyzed with AI, the businesses can actually make a lot more informed decisions or for that matter, decisions which does not even need human intervention at every step. This is where you know the power of both of them coming together is actually gonna help solutions um, or, or you know, scenarios that we're building help us drive a lot more meaningful insights from the data. This will also ensure that you're much more faster, you're much more accurate in what you are predicting and guiding the scenario for. This also helps you balance your requirements for localized as well as for centralized intelligence. And I think um, it's, of course, dependent on the organization, on the scenario that we're dealing with, but it also helps you balance that entire personalization with confidentiality and data privacy. And lastly, and most importantly, I think which most of these high-edge technology have to be very focused on is, this also helps you maintain your security against um, you know, scenarios of cyber attacks or so. But if you really think of it, you know, um, the power of AI and IoT is actually coming at the last bit together. And, and to, to really make sense out of what we are doing, these two have to act together and then derive value out of it. I will quickly move on to, you know, while, while we saw Tesla as an example, while we also saw what, where, where the, the functional view truly really come together. It's important for, for us to understand that which industries may actually be taking advantage of this. And the most obvious one that comes to my mind is the variable zones. Uh, I'm not just talking about smart watches, which is like a norm today, but if you really look at the way this could ex be expanded in your health tech, in your um, AR, VR, in your um, you know, uh, sports and fitness sector, the opportunity is just amazing. 
In fact, uh, I think somewhere I had read that, uh, and I think it was Gartner, um, you know, where the global variable market itself is supposed to be somewhere in billions. Now imagine what it can actually lead to the ancillary support coming in from AI and IoT to be really skyrocketing. Um, this is one of the, you know, most obvious industries where we could just go deep with AIoT as an op opportunity. Smart home. Now, it's just not about smart home. And frankly, I think um, we've come a long way from where, um, you know, we used to visualize smart homes as um, a science fiction uh, to actually it being a reality. Uh, some of our homes are already leveraging this maybe in small aspects of, let's say, lighting, in small aspects of, let's say, alliances, Alexas, and so and so forth of the world. But I think we're talking about, you know, this being, again, an opportunity area where the technology of AI plus IoT literally open up this industry. And imagine, I mean, I'm just not talking about appliances. I'm just not talking about, let's say, your regular uh, engaging devices, but, but we're talking about every aspect of your home, which could be converted into a smart home with the application of this. This is again, a very strong um, industry, which is supposed to be reaching some 300 billion by 2025 or so, can easily you know, be catapulting what AIoT could do in that space. Uh, needless to say, smart city. And then again, the opportunity here is so immense and huge, and especially for a developing country like India. I mean, I, I, I mean, there are a lot of cities who are already beginning to put elements of this in place, but if you're talking about a true smart city, the opportunities, the scenarios are just unbelievable. You talk about public safety, you talk about transport, you talk about traffic, you talk about energy efficiency, you talk about your utilities, every single aspect of your city could actually be a lot more meaningful for your citizens when you're using AIoT as your backbone. Um, I mean, I think there are examples of traffic management already, but it's just about, you know, how do some of us here on the call um, take that next plunge and kind of come up with solutions which can actually help us build that entire smart city as a vector. Moving on to industries, needless to say, your manufacturing, mining, who are on the path of digital transformation. Imagine how much could you really uh, build um, and automate, and at the same time, drive in a lot more efficiencies, effectiveness by leverage of these two technologies. Your supply chain sensors, smart devices, preventing costs, uh, errors, and being a lot more smart about how you produce the products coming out of your manufacturing or mining industry. Uh, again, an area which is supposed to be, I think, already in some sub-segments leading the adoption of IoT, but there's enough and more that could still be looked at to kind of make a true impact on uh, this space. Um, I love this, this retail one. I think, again, the possibilities are immense. Um, I know with COVID coming in, we saw a bit of a challenge in terms of in-person engagements, et cetera, but hopefully with COVID tapering off um, and some of the projects which got started somewhere in 2019, early 2020, are to come to life with AI. We're talking about in-store personalization. We're talking about um, you know, predictions on what the next behavior of customer is gonna be. Basis is historical leverage of sensor plus our AI all brought in together. Again, you know, the possibilities are just amazing in terms of dynamic stuffings, in terms of, you know, how much time the checkout is taking, how do we improve that? And generally making your retail a lot more productive um, than how it has been in the past. And looking at, um, you know, smart, um, smart engagements, smart outputs coming out of this entire retail um, scheme of things. So where does that leave us with in terms of future? I think, you know, if, if I really have to culminate whatever I just spoke and, you know, talking to a multitude of customers in this space, I think the most important element is I do need in skilled resourcing to make this happen. It's just not, I don't want it to be a vision, but I actually want it to be a reality with the right set of skills that helping me do that. I think that's where organizations like you know, big organizations like Google, Microsoft, 
um, AWS, and so on and so forth play a, a very big role along with the government to look at some of the initiatives which can help us build that entire skilling and empower the country with the right resources who can actually take this forward. Um, the fact that, you know, when we're sitting in boardrooms and having conversations, it's no more about, you know, an IT or a CIO guy, a CIO uh, person taking calls on this, but this is about how this becomes a CXO agenda, how a supply chain um, or, a, or a, you know, a supply chain head, or for that matter, a retail head, literally brings in this agenda as their way to digitally transform their own um, set of business units that they're owning. So, and, and we are seeing that shift, but I think it's again an imperative on the industry to be letting it driven by business units rather than just an idea that agenda. One very important element that I saw across both government and uh, businesses in the last uh, two years is a massive, massive shift or acceleration that has happened on adoption of technology, uh, both in government, central state, as well as even in the uh, you know, sectors which have typically been averse to adopting uh, technology. I think this is the time where we need to accelerate now that initial thought of leveraging technology to actually making it a reality with AIoT coming together. Um, lastly, I feel it's not it's not for big giants only to get onto this route or this uh, path, but this is actually about how small businesses can also look at they're going to be improvising their own scheme of things with the leverage of this technology. And you'll be amazed, folks, um, when we're talking in SMB, small and mid-size, there is so much of keenness and, um, you know, let's say, uh, passion to get AIoT into their uh, uh, businesses. But I think, you know, if you're able to help them with resourcing, if you're able to help them with what's the path, they would be the folks to actually adopt this and move fast. So they're always looking at those efficiencies which can help them reduce their costs. And this is a great area to do so. So with all this, I am thinking how some of you may be leveraging some of these thoughts to probably start thinking about where do you innovate and literally make an impact on this particular industry with some of the great ideas that you already may have. So that's what I've had to cover here today, but I'm happy to uh, take any questions, clarifications that may help the uh, team who's on the call here. Thank you so much, Ruchi, for that presentation and covering uh, AI and IoT and their implementation in real life and the future. And we have some questions from the batch coming in. So can we take that up? Absolutely, yes. I'll be... Uh, to ask him the question. So, community assistance is very essential in IoT. Do you see data privacy as a hindrance in the development of IoT? So, um, not at all. As a matter of fact, this is an opportunity for us. You know, how do we become a lot more clear about tackling the privacy issues that come along with these razor edge technology? And literally, you know, to that impact, also looking at our uh, leadership in the government to be making it a lot more quicker, easier construct on data privacy, which can be crystal clear with the organizations to pick up and then align towards it. You know, where does the problem come when you're literally not clear on what are the data privacy guidelines, issues that one has to abide by? If we have clarity, if the industry has clarity on that, believe me, the solutions, the tech can actually wrap itself around it. So I don't see this as a hindrance. I rather see this as a probably opportunity now for the country to step up and say, how do we define data privacy for our set of business, for our set of uh, data usage, and then translate that into how the organizations are leveraging that to build up the next uh, business scenarios. Uh, okay, thank you for that. And the next question is, how important is business process management maturity to position the organization in better place to use IoT data? Uh, see, this all goes hand in hand, and I think this is coming in from Sagar. So Sagar, uh, you know, you can't wait for a perfect process to start off leverage of technology. Um, it's, it actually goes hand in hand in terms of, you know, when you're rethinking your process with the leverage of this razor cut, you'll find opportunities to improvise, and at the same time, 
leverage technology to a better use. Uh, so I'm of the opinion that you, one doesn't have to wait for the uh, nth level of maturity to start leveraging, but it actually goes hand in hand. And you'll see a lot of examples where actual innovations or process improvement came in once you start thinking, now I need to use IoT or AI or for that matter, edge computing in my business process. And voila, you came up with a process that was so logical and good. Uh, the next question is, uh, do, you uh, do you think that an international organization would be required to take control of uniting the Internet of Things into one system through controlling, standardizing, and providing security? Very oh, interesting question, Ravi. Um, see, I, I don't, again, you know, um, it's also about democrat democratizing the usage of such technology. And um, while we, we do want to have... Um, logical controls in place, logical uh, standardization, and hence ensuring the relevant security is etc. But it would be very, um, I mean, one has to think through that. How does that one central authority really still keep the elements of individuality that each country organization may need to democratize the usage of such technologies? So there are standards that each um, you know, um, sector, each industry, each country may follow. It's about how are those at a, at a central level thought in a lot more meaningful manner, keeping in mind the scenarios that we've seen in the past, cyber attacks, the uh, challenges that one may have faced. And that's exactly where I was going up on the anonymous attendee question, uh, data privacy one as well, because uh, it's never about one central agency dictating terms, but it's about how do you build that collectively to do the right set of things, which will ensure we're not compromising. Uh, and at the same time, doing things the right way without um, you know, letting any risk, et cetera, come into the play. Uh, Ravi, I'd be very happy to have this in a detailed conversation. It's just not a yes or no kind of an answer, but it actually involves a lot of elements um, and in some historical perspective also on how these technologies have truly evolved and uh, what's the right way to democratize them as well. But I hope that helps. Um, yeah, yeah, it really does, Rich. Okay. So uh, I think we are at the end of the session. So thank you, Ruchi, for taking your time on a Sunday morning and giving us a great presentation about artificial intelligence and IoT and also patiently answering their questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I enjoyed my time with you folks. If there's anything else that I could help you with, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, hello, Amit. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Amit. I can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, so, uh, Amit, we have a small intro uh, ready for you. So, after that, you can take uh, take forward the session. Is that okay? Sure, sure. So I, you know, what I have is a is a accompanying uh, PowerPoint deck, and I don't think I should take more than 10, 12 minutes. And after that, you know, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, sure. Okay, sounds good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, the next speaker of our Innovator Talk series is our very own alumnus, Mr. Amit Ranjan. He is the architect of DigiLocker and OpenForge. And he's the founder of uh, SlideShare. Uh, and DigiLocker and Open uh, OpenForge, two government uh, governance uh, projects under the Digital India Mission at the Ministry of IT's National E-Government e Division. He's an engineering graduate from NIT Jaipur 
where he majored in mechanical engineering and an MBA graduate from FMS. And he is a firm believer in sharing credo. The more you share, the more it benefits others. The ecosystem grows and some of that good karma returns to you. And I really like that credo, Avit. And you can go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, great. So first of all, I think, you know, uh, thanks for this opportunity to get back uh, to students of the alma mater. It's always uh, nostalgic and also inspiring to kind of be talking to, you know, students who are from the same institute that you went to. So thanks for this opportunity. Right, so um, I'll start off. Uh, so, you know, the topic for today that I'm going to be talking about is something which is, uh, it's actually, uh, you know, a fairly well or hotly debated topic over the, over the ages as far as startups go. And uh, this is about the, the, the important question of should start startups uh, focus on profitability or should they kind of go after growth? Uh, and especially, you know, new age startups. And, uh, you know, back uh, in 2005, when we started SlideShare, I mean, this topic was relevant even at that time. So it's not new actually. And uh, what I'll do uh, or what I'll try to do here today is to kind of, you know, spend about 10, 15 minutes uh, walking uh, you through a few of the points that are involved with this particular issue. Uh, I have a accompanying uh, presentation. So let me just bring that up. Okay. Uh, okay. So is my screen visible? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, great. So I'll put this into uh, presentation mode. And uh, so let me kind of, you know, get started with this. So yeah, so this is about, you know, evaluating new age startups, profitability versus growth. And as I said that this question, you know, is relevant uh, today as it was 15 years ago when I was kind of, you know, getting started with my slideshare journey. And I think uh, to, to understand this question, I think it may be instructive to just kind of go back, go back to the basics a little bit and look at it from first principles. So I think the first question or the first point to consider is what are startups actually? How do you define startups? And I think part of the answer or part of the discussion uh, on the profitability versus growth actually comes from the definition itself. And there's no better way to define, you know, what startups are than what, uh, you know, Paul Graham of Wine Combinator said when he said that a startup is a, is a company which is designed to grow fast. In fact, he had this very famous uh, blog post going way back to, I think, 2010 or 11, where he's, he came out with this, this formula per se, says startups is equal to growth. So startups are not about tech, they're not about venture capital, but they are about fast growth. And what you'll, what you'll see and realize is that pretty much everything that you associate with startups kind of follows or flows from this fundamental principle, right? So while we, while we define startups as growth, it is also worth taking a step back and understanding that you know, not all businesses are startups. There are many kinds of businesses that do not fit into this model. And these could be you know, SMEs, these could be local businesses, these, these could be you know, uh, what is referred to as lifestyle businesses. Uh, they do not follow this pattern and it would be, uh, I, I don't think you should be labeling them as startups at all. The second thing that you see about startups is that they are inherently risky. The fact is that most of them would die and a few would actually go on to change the world. So what does this mean from a capital or a finance perspective? What this means is that, you know, for all practical purposes, traditional finance, that is debt, is kind of ruled out. And that's where venture capital kind of, you know, comes into the picture. So what is venture capital? So venture capital is this, this, this kind of, you know, financing mechanism for risk, risky ventures. And the best way to understand how venture capital works is to understand this point about power law, right? So what you see is that in venture capital, the returns don't follow normal distribution 
like the normal distribution curve that we are all familiar with, but it tends to be skewed towards exceptions, skewed towards outliers, right? And a good example to kind of, you know, think about this is, uh, so think of the normal distribution curve and think of, you know, returns from the public markets, for example, stocks that you buy on the share markets, or you pick up anything like, you know, look, look at something like average human life expectancy, right? Or you look at the average height or the average weight of humans on this planet. What you'll find is that pretty much all of these things tend to follow what is called the normal distribution curve. Now, unlike these, these, these normal distribute, normally distributed variables, venture capital actually bucks the trend and it follows a completely different path. Venture capital follows what is called the power law, which, which means that the majority of the returns or the majority of the outcome will come from very few cases, right? And this happens in venture capital. It happens in other, other domains as well. For example, video games. Uh, it happens in music sales. So these are examples uh, of um, these are these these are these are domains or these are you know industries where the normal normal distribution curve doesn't really apply, uh, and what you have really is the power law driven um, your venture capital model. And what this actually leads you to is that uh, VC funds tend to have shorter lifespans. They typically are you know anything between seven to ten years. The chances of success, as you might imagine, is much low. You know, it's something like a one on, one on a 10. And the model only works if you have very large outcomes. So think, think 100x, think 1000x, right? That's how the model actually, you know, delivers return and actually justifies uh, itself. So what does the large outcome actually mean? Worth, worth spending a couple of moments on this as well. It's that large outcome typically means that you're talking about a very large target market. You're talking about a market that has you know, lots and lots of users and it allows the creation of a multiple or at least one or two fast growing startups. Uh, startups would, you know, kind of, you know, to achieve this, they would have to, uh, you know, shift user behavior in a rapid manner, lead, leading to the creation of new habits, you know, kind of leading to high frequency use cases. And the way to do this is to achieve fast growth and fast distribution. And finally, the, what you're trying to achieve here is that you're trying to kind of have pricing power. So that is what the venture capital model is, which kind of brings us back to the discussion that we have today is about growth and profits. And what you realize is that this is, this is a constant balancing act. This is almost like a chicken and an egg problem that confronts you know, startups throughout their evolutionary journey. It's not just at a particular point in time, it's a continuous thing. And uh, there are no right answers to this actually, right? It depends on a bunch of factors. It depends on markets, it depends on competition, it depends on profit pools that are there in the market. And uh, what you might also see is that how a startup kind of you know, addresses this question over a period of time along their journey would actually change from time to time. What they might be doing at, at a particular moment in their evolutionary journey early on could be actually very different from what they would do when they are a more mature company or when they kind of graduate to being, a, let's say an IPO and a public company. Uh, it also in incidentally depends on the kind of businesses that we are talking about. So, I think an e-commerce business versus a marketplace versus social networks versus SaaS or core tech, all of these domains would have, you know, very different treatments about how to look at the growth versus profit equation. And I think this is, you know, uh, this is one of the frameworks that I read about a few years back. And I found this a very good way to wrap your head around this growth versus profitability equation as to how to kind of think about this. So think of the startup's evolutionary journey as some kind of a glide path. And you know, what you've done here is that you've plotted the growth and the profitability axis, and you're trying on the, on the, same, on the same graph. And you're trying to kind of you know, understand how over a period of time, how as the startup you know, progresses from a seed stage and an angel stage to series A, B, C, D, and finally to an IPO, how do these two graphs actually behave? And you, you can see that there is almost like a convergence towards the later stage of the journey. And what I really mean by this is that imagine the, if you, if you kind of you know, divide the journey of 
uh, of a startup into three stages. So think early stage, mid stage, and late stage. Uh, in the early stages, you know, the focus is squarely and largely on establishing product market fit. You know, it's very common to see startups, you know, burning a lot of cash to, to fund their uh, for fund growth and distribution. Uh, you might be having a little bit of early monetization experiments, but by and large, uh, uh, you know, it's very common to see startups prioritizing growth over profit. So in this phase of their journey, clearly, you know, uh, prioritizing growth over profit profits, you know, is a very done thing. Uh, which kind of brings you to the next stage. So think of a startup which is in the series B, C, D kind of a stage. And you know, by this time, typically you would have achieved some level of network effects. You have multiple revenue lines that have started emerging. Uh, in all probabilities, you would have kind of, you know, got into a situation where the LTV, the lifetime value is greater than the customer acquisition cost. So you have some semblance of positive unit economics or you are you know, EBITDA positive. So this is a kind of the intermediate stage between the early and the late stages. And you'll see that you know, startups would kind of you know, slowly start becoming more and more prudent as far as you know, spending on achieving growth is concerned, which kind of brings you to the last stage. So think of this as the later stage or the pre-IPO stage or the IPO stage, or even you know, post-IPO when they actually go on to become a public company is that uh, by this time, clearly, uh, the company would have stable products, it would have established revenue lines, uh, it would be profitable, it would be generating cash. Uh, you know, there's fair amount of financial discipline that has kind of set in by now. You have financial budgets, you have forecastings, you have, you know, uh, you have a CFO, you have financial controller. So, so as you as this kind of slide indicates, is that this is the glide path that I was referring to in the previous slide, is that along the the, the, the journey that a startup has, you would see this growth versus profitability equation changing significantly over the lifetime, right? And which kind of brings me to, you know, the almost the end of my presentation here. And I think that, you know, any discussion um, on growth versus profitability that we are having in 2022, and we don't, uh, if you don't uh, uh, refer to what's happening in the Indian tech startup IPOs, I think it'll be slightly disingenuous because I think it's important to kind of, you know, understand what to make of the what's happening with tech startups in India, especially the ones that are going IPO from a growth versus profitability standpoint. I mean, is there, a, is there some inherent contradiction between these two things? Because if you say that, you know, uh, it is good or it is okay to prioritize growth at certain stages of the startup's journey. What happens when you go IPO? So I think, you know, it is, in, so so here's what I would kind of, you know, think about this. How do you reconcile this, this seemingly disparate, uh, you know, correlation between growth, growth versus profitability equation on one side and, you know, what's happening with startup IPOs and valuations. And clearly, you know, I think all of us would be aware of the fact that a bunch of Indian startups, you know, Nayaka and Policy Bazaar and Paytm and so on and so forth, they've gone, uh, you know, public over the last six months. There's been a lot of excitement, exuberance in the stock markets, but unfortunately, you know, they tend to be uh, dramatically down compared to their IPO listings. So what is happening here? And I think that to, to kind of try to understand you know, what's happening with these IPOs, you, you might as well take a step back and first get a sense of, you know, not every startup is, is similar. I mean, you have different kinds, different segments, different classes of startups. And to my mind, one of the ways, one of the ways I've uh, always tried to, uh, to explain this is that, so there are two broad categories of startups, right? One is what I would call, the one on the right is, is transactional businesses, right? And what we have on the left that I've described here, I mean, I tend to refer to them as what are either experiential businesses or they are platform businesses. And you would, you would understand, I mean, if you take a look at this, you'll, fi you'll find that these two buckets, these two segments actually tend to behave fairly differently from a growth versus profitability or evaluation perspective. So in, in the platform and the experiential types, you, know, you probably have some real competitive advantage. You know, you are you you have a situation that is defensible, that is moated, which kind of leads to a situation where you have fairly high gross margins, and you know the kind of businesses that fall in this category often are you know SaaS businesses, social networks, uh, 
uh, there could be core technology. So while they do monetize at scale, but yet those monetization is defensible because the gross margins are much higher. Compare this to you know, the transactional bucket, which is largely you know, things like e-commerce, think of you know, two-sided marketplaces, think of payment companies, where A, the first distinguishing factor is that you have competition with offline. You know, these businesses tend to be omni-channel. What has probably happened in these transactional businesses is that there was some offline activity, which has now actually moved online due to the ongoing digitization in the world around us. But unfortunately, this does not lend itself to a very defensible competitive advantage. You have a lot of companies, they tend to be very similar. There's no real competitive advantage. And what this finally leads to is that, you know, you are talking about a low gross margin business. You really don't have any pricing power, right? So having understood these two kinds of businesses, I think what is happening here with these IPOs here is that I don't, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that this is actually in any way, uh, you know, contradictory to what I just told you about the growth versus profits, um, you know, uh, equation. I think the problem here is a pricing problem. It's a valuation problem. And there's a little bit of historical context to what has happened here. I mean, in 2008, the world was hit by the financial crisis. And, uh, you know, governments and central banks, the way they kind of responded to the financial crisis was they went into what is called the quantitative easing, which led to printing of money. And there was like easy liquidity sloshing around the world markets, as it has been for the last almost 10, 12 years. And anyway, I mean, during COVID, that has gone to another level. But this phenomenon actually is, has been happening for the last 10 or 12 years. What that, is, what that has led to is a situation where there's hot money flowing into, into asset markets. Right. And this hot money flowing into assets in this particular case into, you know, uh, stock markets, public stock markets and private equity and venture capital driven private markets is that it has it has finally led to a situation that is a fundamental mismatch between, you know, the valuations that you have between the public markets and the private markets and the, 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 the drawdowns that we are seeing with these Indian IPOs using value over you know, the values uh, uh, over the, the, the prices at which they have gone public is essentially this mismatch between the expectancies that the private markets have and the public markets have, right? So I think, you know, the good thing about capitalism is that markets are, are usually very efficient at solving some of these inefficiencies. So we hope and uh, that, you know, eventually over a period of time, this, this will get corrected. Uh, having said that, I do think that, you know, uh, my personal view is that a few of those IPOs, uh, you know, do look a little premature. They do look a little ahead of its time. I mean, uh, that goes without saying as well. So there's probably some excesses that have, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, happened along along the IPO journey for some of these startups, and uh, hoping that you know that eventually, kind of, you know, smoothens out uh, smoothens out as well. So, so that's how, and that's what I meant by saying is that I think it's important to reconcile the difference between growth and profitability on one hand versus what is happening with, you know, startup valuations and these IPOs. So that's, that's all I have, you know, um, I'm happy to kind of take any questions and, uh, you know, walk you through some of the assumptions or any of the other things that I just explained. Thank you so much, Amit, for the presentation and also shedding some light on the growth and profitability debate and also about the IPO industry. We have some questions from the batch. Is that okay if we take that up? Yeah, sure, sure. So I can see about four or five questions. So I think the first question is from Ananya. Right, so the question is as an angel investor, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, give me a moment, one second. Uh, do you want me to read that out aloud so that you can answer the question? Yeah, you can. Yeah, that'll be better actually. I think it'll be better from an yeah. interacted uh, interaction standpoint. Yeah. So, uh, as an angel investor yourself, in terms of proportion, what weights would, uh, would you give to scalability and profitability of an early stage startup? See, I think early stage by definition, uh, I would not focus a whole lot on profitability, right? Uh, I, uh, if you if you go back to that slide that I earlier showed you, or maybe, uh, you know, I think what you really want to achieve in the early part of a startup journey is to have evidence of product market fit, 
So there should be some fulfillment in terms of what the product is try to do. You should have users mm-hmm. or customers who who are coming back to you and telling you, yeah, this product actually solves my problem, and some of them may be willing to pay for it. So you might have some early early monetization pilots or experiments. Uh, you should you should definitely kind of you know try to achieve product market fit. I I mean I think it's worth pointing out is that uh, the word scalability is to my mind one of the most uh, used and abused words uh, as far as startups go. Uh, it's a word that uh, you know gets talked about a lot. But honestly, I think there is there are multiple steps before you reach the the the. the milestone of scalability you first need to achieve what is what i would call is feasibility the second stage is what is repeatability and scalability is actually the third stage so at the early stage what i would actually look for is evidence of feasibility and maybe some evidence of repeatability that it's a it's feasible it solves a problem b it solves a problem not just for one or two people it maybe solves a problem from for depending on the kind of business that you are in uh, hundreds or thousands of people uh true scalability honestly i wouldn't really expect a startup to have in the early stages that tends to happen during the mid or the late stages thank you for that amit the next question is uh, india has had 21 unicorns last year compared to 36 in the 10 year period from 2011 to 2020 even taking into account the increased tech adoption due to covid an average of 3.6 startups per year to 21 in 8 months uh, last year along with zomato's ipo being massively oversubscribed what would be your take on the technology space and the market condition right now do you think uh, it is overvalued or is it a natural process of consistent and rapid growth yeah so you know that was i mean my the last part of my presentation was essentially about this only i would clearly i would i think uh, it goes without saying that there is uh, overvaluation here and the reason for the, eval- uh, the for this overvaluation also i pointed out is that it is not happening only right now in 2022 this is actually a carry over of what has been happening uh, post the financial crisis where there has been a uh, you know some kind of uh, over inflation or bubbles in the asset markets right so that has led to a situation where uh you know in a you know the private markets have gotten maybe overheated and there is a clear mismatch between the valuation expectancies of private markets versus pub, uh, versus public markets so yeah to 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 your question i i definitely think that is overvalued uh how would this be get resolved i think you know as i said you know uh i i think in general capitalism is 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 a pretty efficient system at trying to kind of you know even out these inefficiencies uh unfortunately what has also happened is that covid has hit and covid has kind of you know unleashed uh, a set of uh, factors and uh, conditions whereby you know the tech companies and the tech startups uh, have kind of you know got valued even more so that has maybe kind of delayed the the gradual evening out and the um, you know the solution to this problem but i have no doubt that uh, you know this would happen and you're seeing this what you're seeing right now with uh, these startups losing value not just in india by the way this is happening in um, in uh, in the us on nasdaq as well so so i think eventually this will kind of you know even out uh, so uh, amit to the positive of them can we just take one last question sure sure Uh, so you have succeeded in your roles both while working at well established firms to starting your own company so i wanted to know if uh, it was a smooth transition and how do you know the idea is good enough to leave the job what parameters are i mean to look at while evaluating the startup ideas uh you know wow this is like uh, this is kind of the the all important question as far as my professional journey goes so i think uh, you know yeah you're right in saying that uh, i've actually switched tracks multiple times now post fms when i actually went into a uh, career as an mba i kind of spent almost half a decade into it i worked at you know companies like asian paints and uh, pepsi and uh, then i kind of you know from there i moved on to doing my own startup which i did for about 10 12 years and then finally from there i actually went on to work in the government so to answer your question no it has not been a smooth transition Uh, i would also be honest enough in saying that for me uh, both these transitions 
kind of have not been very planned they were not been like you know thought through very carefully with a lot of planning uh, you know behind it they have been largely more i would say serendipitous they have been sudden they have been accidental um, and uh, but you know one of the things that has happened to me over the years is that in general what i have seen is that whenever i have kind of you know planned medium to long term uh, you know things really don't seem to be playing out whereas when i actually kind of in the moment when i actually tend to take these these important decisions in the moment in the heat of the moment uh, i i seem to have made you know far more impact in that situation uh, than you know thinking about and planning about it long term so at least that's what happened to me but i i would suspect that's true for a lot of people as well because i think the problem with long term planning sometimes is that you you know it's a very rigid it's a very uh, inflexible world view of the uh, of what's going to happen in the world 10 or 20 years out uh, uh, last point in your question do i know the idea when i i mean how do you know that the idea is good enough honestly there's no way of knowing that um, the only way to kind of you know try to answer that is to um is to kind of you know try it out and see if it works or not and that's where the risk also comes in for that idea and um, yeah so so i don't think there are there are any silver bullets uh, which you can use to kind of you know evaluate an idea ahead of time you can do a little bit of experiments and pilots just to get a, a some pointers but but uh, no silver bullets thank you so much amit for sharing your journey and the decisions that you had to make uh, i think uh, that will be the end as there is a paucity of time thank you so much amit for your presentation thank you it was great uh, interacting with uh, fms students and uh, you know thanks a lot for this opportunity it was great hearing to, uh, to you to amit and thank you for taking your time out on a sunday thank you so much Uh, Vikas sir, uh, we'll be starting in a conference in a few minutes. Uh. Sure, I just thought I'll dial <laughs> a few minutes before. So one thirty is the time. Are we on track? Or are we running late? Yeah, we are on track. Uh, once all the speakers uh, join in, we'll be starting. All right. So I'll just stand by. Yeah. Yeah. Thank all you right. so much. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to the Entrepreneurship Summit 2022. After the successful completion of the innovative talk series in the morning, which features industry leaders, our next, next segment is the most awaited entrepreneurship con conference. Entrepreneurship Conference is a platform where FMS Delhi invites business leaders to its campus to share their valuable experience and knowledge with academia. The panelists of the Entrepreneurship Conference discuss on a topic that attempts to give students and aspiring entrepreneurs a glimpse of the rapidly changing industry from the perspective of top leaders. The agenda for today's discussion is rise of unicorns in India. And we have with us four prominent leaders from the Indian startup ecosystem, which will be joining us today for the panel discussion. Firstly, we have with us Deepak Parik. He's the co-founder of Career Kida, a platform that impacts professional specific practical training and skill development to help people employable in the 21st century. In addition to this, he's also a digital content creator and creates millennial friendly, thought provoking content that mainly focuses on upskilling the youth of the country. Next, we have Vikas Kuthiala. He has a professional experience of 35 plus years and a successful track record in India and abroad in a wide range of industries, including FMCG, healthcare services, EMS, and a 24 hour global emergency assistance. In addition, he has over 20 years of hands on experience in four startups as an executive leader in various sectors. In 2009, he also established and co founded Falc India, a medical emergency services company also established uh, to help in the Indian healthcare segment. Next, we are joined by Neha Juneja. She's currently the co-founder and CEO of India P2P. She has been the co-founder of Greenway Appliances, which is a startup that designs and markets efficient cooking solutions to rural households. For the past 11 years in rural India, she has organized community-led projects and provided need analysis consulting in a variety of areas such as agroforestry, primary energy supply, and water access. She has been internationally recognized for her excellence in product design. Moving on, we are joined by Kapil Jain, is the co-founder of Crypto Minter, a web 3.0 marketplace protocol to monetize creative work without the cost and complexity of coding. He is also the chief executive officer for Graffito Labs. In addition to this, he has also worked with Ruchi Soya Industries as an executive advisor to managing director and head projects and government solutions. I welcome you all today and thank you all for joining us. Now moving on to today's discussion, let's set the pre-context. It's raining unicorns in India. Amid an un unprecedented funding spree for India startups across sectors, as of 9 February 2022, India is home to 88 unicorns with a total valuation of approximately 295 billion US dollars. The year 2021, 2022, and 2019 saw the birth of maximum number of Indian unicorns, with 44, 10, and 9 unicorns adding to the spree each year, respectively. COVID-19 has caused a great amount of socioeconomic suffering globally, but it is, it is during this time when the resilient Indian entrepreneurs and the Indian startup ecosystem has worked effortlessly to not only contribute to the economy, but to also contribute towards COVID-19 relief efforts. In 2020, we witnessed the birth of more than 10 unicorns. It's raining unicorns has been the motto of the year 2021. With, 20, with 44 unicorns pumped in the ecosystem and many unicorns still in the waiting pipeline. So this panel discussion today, we will look into the aspects of the reasons for the same. The impact of government support, use of crisis as an opportunity, future prospects given the Fed rate hike and geopolitical tensions. Now, I would like to open the floor for the fellow panelists to carry the discussion forward. I would invite any of the uh, panelists to open the floor and lead the discussion. All right, Neha, why don't you go? Uh, thank you, Vikas, and um, hello, everyone. Um, sure. So um, I'll, I'll take the, I'll give a little start here. So I've been, um, I graduated from FMS back in 2008, just giving you a little bit of a story there and started right after. I started a derivatives trading platform back in 2007, 2008. 
and um, and the startup scene was very different there. So I've been subsequently been in the I've not held the job. I've been in various three startups essentially, and I've seen uh, through the years how things have changed at least back from two thousand and eight to now. I think there's a much greater recognition of um, uh, what a startup's journey looks like. There's a much better understanding. There's more money. There's more. Uh, there's more. I mean, in spite. Uh, I mean, uh, the world economy is kind of supportive of venture funding at the moment. Things might change, but it is supportive of venture funding at the moment. But there's also a lot of domestic money at play here, which essentially goes on to say that over the years, um, there's. A sort of a playbook has been set as to you launch a venture, you raise money, certain things work, certain things may not work, some ventures may work, some ventures may not work, and you take things from there. And um, I would say that um, this is a really great time to do a startup because your ambitions are not constrained by the amount of resources you can raise. So this is not a time where resources are hard. I mean, five years ago, 10 years ago, if you wanted to do something um, you know, you had to worry about raising money, you had to worry about uh, making, you know, your product work, other things work, and you also had to worry about, you know, breaking even at some point in time. But I think at this stage, uh, entrepreneurs don't have to worry about the stress of having resources, just build the business the way you want, and take it from there. And I think just that flip, just that flip in thinking is uh, what is causing us to see so many unicorns. But on the flip side, on the flip side, it also means that we have too many enterprises uh, dependent on just um, a steady stream of resources. And that may not necessarily be a good thing, that, that there has to be some balance somewhere. I will, I will, I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Anya, yeah, thanks. Uh, I. Uh... <laughs> Totally and fully agree with you. I have been an so I'm 84 batch FMS, right? So after having a reasonably a lengthy career as uh, a corporate executive, I turned an entrepreneur in 2009. Then I successfully exited my my venture and became a full time angel investor. But I had been doing angel investing since 2009, so I've seen, you know, all the changes that you just mentioned. In your, in your opening remarks. So, you know, <clears throat> I'd say that what I see happening is that the whole startup ecosystem way back in 2009-10 was fueled by curiosity, which was brought into India by successful entrepreneurs who had seen how it has worked primarily in the Silicon Valley, who kind of felt that this could be built in India. And I think they made a brave start, right? So whatever things that Neha said, it was early, it was, things were very difficult. Entrepreneurs had to struggle. Funding was a big issue. Uh, but I think credit to all those young startup founders who took the plunge, stayed in the space and created the confidence for it to gain larger traction. From the initial curiosity phase, I think it turned into a supportive phase because when people saw encouraging results and when they felt that, you know, India has all the mix, all the energy, passion, ideas, opportunities, except they were lacking in capital and which kind of started to come in through and thank God for, you know, a very fortuitous environment around the world, the interest rates were very low. So capital could travel across borders at a very low cost and support even at the deep end, Indian angel investment startups and founders. And I think that was very, very critical. So that was the second phase. It turned from curiosity to supportive. And I think over the last few years, we have seen that supportive has now turned into confidence and bullishness. And the one marker for that is that, you know, in the right till about three years ago, the entrepreneurs of startups were carrying the entire burden of creating a definitive story of success. You know, they bring the idea, the passion, the energy, the struggle, the failure, the success, and you know. But about two years ago, when the large Indian business houses started to move into the entrepreneurial startup ecosystem and began to cut big checks to acquire 
you know, very, very successful market leading ventures, then you know that it has now arrived. The moment of the eight, 10 years of struggle and journey has culminated in entrepreneurs being recognized by very, very large business leaders because they felt that now, not only do we have a very large number of scaled up ventures, unicorns as we call them, but they were actually addressing successfully a definitive need which the Indian consumers were now sort of paying for with their wallet, right? So I think once that began to happen, then the whole explosion of rapid scale up began. And now you see, you know, as, <clears throat> as was said in the opening remarks, it's raining unicorns. We'll come back in the discussion why, you know, we have to still exercise caution, you know, just because you're over the fence and now your unicorn is on a permanent status. It's not a Padam Shiri, you know, you still have to struggle and see how you continue to make things successful as the pumps and then get harder. So I think I'll stop in that. And, you know, as a conversation ensues, I kind of share more views. Thank you. Kapil, uh, would you like to go next? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so I have a little bit of connection with FMS. Uh, in the year 2009, I guess I was one of the business uh, presenter in your college. Thank you so much for inviting me after a decade or so. So, uh, you know, uh, we all are talking about what were the, you know, lagging factors uh, about this, uh, you know, uni unicorn uh, scenario right now existing in India. But what about the, you know, leading factors, right? So uh, if we talk about, you know, number of startup who got registered with, uh, you know, the startup ecosystem in India is roughly 63,000. 63, and we are talking about 100 unicorns, right? So... So roughly, you know, uh, one out of uh, 1,000 startup uh, is becoming an unicorn. So uh, in unicorn, you know, we need to understand that this is just a number of being valuated as a unicorn. People are now talking about uh, Decacorn, you know, $10 billion valuation, you know, Hectocorn, $100 billion valuation. So the idea is that, you know, after being, as rightly mentioned by, you know, Vikas sir, that it is not a Padam Shri, right? It is a big responsibility because... Uh, from pre-seed round, so many of uh, the listeners are students, right? So from that bootstrapping to pre-seed to seed to series A to series E, there's a long journey, right? And at every stage, you know, you have to prove some milestones which you have achieved. So when I started my journey, when I was back from the US in 2014, uh, the ecosystem actually got too much, uh, you know, uh, uh, friendly to the startups. And in last three to four years, you know, because of the various nudge effects by uh, government of India in terms of, you know, giving impetus to the startup. Now being a startup guy is not a table, you know, uh, honorable prime minister or, you know, people who are uh, actually making the policies are actually promoting, you know, students to be entrepreneurs, right? So instead of uh, being a job seeker, can you be an employment creator, you know? And this is being, uh, you know, considered uh, as a prestige uh, issues also that, you know, I'm a startup guy, you know, uh, even at the age of say 40 or something, you know, we take pride in saying that, okay, I have two startups which I'm running, you know, one is into healthcare, one is into cryptocurrency and stuff like that. So uh, impetus is there. And then, you know, a lot of infrastructure has also been provided. So one of my very close friends, you know, who co-founded Razorpay, you know, uh, he started his journey by a small incubation center, which was supported by IIT Mumbai. Right. So these small, small things, which takes you to those uh, rounds from, say, pre-seed or conception level to series E, and then you become a unicorn, you have to have a series of efforts which are concerted in a meaningful direction. Uh, we talk about various sectors which, uh, you know, uh, have actually, uh, you know, uh, bloomed to be a unicorn. Few of them uh, are in fintech, right, uh, marketplaces, uh, SaaS and stuff like that. So three things which happened after 2016, one is the penetration of internet, right? We have roughly 55% smartphone users right now in India, right? 65% penetration of say broadband access or internet access. Secondly, the UPI system which happened, right? So people are now uh, having access to pay it digitally, 
right? So people uh, are, can get money. So the startups like us can get money uh, at a click of second. So the turnaround time of those payment system has certainly increased. And thirdly, uh, you know, this last two years, which we have seen wherein, you know, people are actually more technological friendly. So earlier, you know, uh, we used to think, okay, startup, buy, sell, or, you know, some value is being created, uh, but what about, you know, the numbers? We have seen uh, multiple startup who have closed uh, revenues of $100 million, right? So when we talk about valuation, it is not the money which is pumped in, in terms of the valuation where, you know, a person is putting say $100 million at a valuation of $1 billion, but there are actual revenue numbers which are being supported uh, so that those startup who went till 1 billion can actually go to 5 million. And in last six months, we have seen IPOs coming up, right? So they have given an exit those to those investor who put in money, right? All, all this, uh, so like Mr. Uh, you know, Vikas, he's a investor himself. Uh, so he is investing so that you know, he may get say 10X or 50X or 100X. So are there avenues of exit? which are being considered at a policy level by government. And even if you are not a uh, you know, surplus or a profit-making company, you can go and list in uh, you know, stock market and uh, you know, people who have invested can actually uh, come out of it by making money. I'll add a few more points once you know, uh, the forum is open for discussion. Over to you, Deepak. Thank you, Kapil. Thank you, Neha. And thank you, Vikas, sir, for all your insights. Um, I have a fresh perspective. I am not an FMS uh, alumni. Uh, I uh, graduated from St. Xavier's Calcutta uh, fairly young. I think five years back I graduated, which I consider myself as old, but <laughs> that, that, that's where I come from. Uh, so, so yeah, I think uh, when we're talking about unicorns, we're talking about uh, startups gaining the unicorn status and um, decacorn status and hectagon status. What I personally feel is we're coming <laughs> from, from the base of funding, right? And what what exactly um, is glamorized in the in the startup ecosystem is how much funds you've raised. Uh, we proudly uh, are a bootstrapped company, wherein we 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 haven't felt the need to seek any external funding whatsoever till date, and we are proud to say that. Um, in terms of in terms of funding, I think we've always given a thought: ki our funding raise karna chahiye ki nahi karna chahiye. It's something that we've always thought of and of course if you have if you have raised a certain amount of money for your startup there is um, an access to a lot more resources a, lo a lot more avenues but then you give away equity as well um, and then of course you give away ownership uh, in, in its truest sense one of the things that i heard about startups and of course it's very prevalent in the startup ecosystem is that once you start raising funds there's no stopping Right, you it's a it's a it's like a vicious cycle of funding wherein you start raising funds, you you start with pre seed, then you go with seed, then series A, B, C, D, E, F. The list goes on and on, right? So you you start raising funds, uh, pre seed, uh, you then sh show some traction, then you go to uh, seed funding, then you go to series A, B, C, and as you know, um, as Kapil mentioned, you got to show some traction to the investor before raising the next round of funding. So again, uh, coming back to the baseline about startups gaining unicorn status, uh, especially in 2022, I think around 10 startups have already gained unicorn status. I think uh, more so we need to stop glamorizing funding and start glamorizing product. That is something that in essence, in its truest sense, what startup is all about, because I've seen so many startups build and fail uh, I'm sure we all have, all have seen a lot of uh, promising startups fail just because they couldn't show traction, just because uh, the product wasn't promising enough. They've raised funds, but then uh, they failed as a product. So what essentially matters to me as a startup founder, as an entrepreneur, is just product market fit. If the product fits the market, whether the product fits the market or not, that's it. If it fits the market, if it's uh, consumed by the consumers, great, I'm good to go. Funding, of course, is an external factor that will help you gain access and get speed uh, and get there faster. But then that's necessarily not the right, uh, you know, uh, right way to, to gain speed and get traction. Of course, I, as I mentioned, uh, once you start raising funds, there's no stopping you. You keep on raising funds to give the previous investor the exit. 
but um, you need to decide whether whether your startup actually requires funding or not. So uh, that's that's my two bits. That's my opening remarks. I'm sure once the forum opens uh, for discussion, uh, we'll we'll uh, you know get uh, dive deep into it. So Deepak, I really resonate with a lot of things that you said. I can only add, you know, look, not every startup has a DNA which is suitable to ingest risk capital, right? There, the problem here sometimes is that any founder who starts any new venture and puts on the sticker of a startup, they now feel that they are eligible and entitled to seek funding. And as you very rightly said, you know, people who are investing in your startup know a few things that one, I have to place many bets because, you know, as uh, Kapil said that one in a thousand, you know what? It's not gonna get any better for unicorns because that is the stat, right? So thousands of people practice in the nets and you only get one Kapil Dev or you get one Dhoni, right? And that's the unicorn of cricket and that's no different to the kind of success rate if unicorn is the marker of success given today's discussion, right? So not every startup uh, can do justice to taking in risk capital because as the said, that means that now you are on a treadmill that you constantly have to run faster to create value so that the incoming investor is able to get an exit and you're continuing to you know, attract more and more capital to grow. Sometimes it works. Most of the time it does not work if your journey is a unicorn. Now, whenever anybody is investing in a startup, whether it's an angel round or whether it's a more mature round, they will try to, that's just because you're talking here to students, and what should be their focus if they have a dream to build a startup, which will be one unicorn. <coughs> they will look for three things principally. Team, traction, TAM, target addressable market. So you may have initially a very sharp definition of that combination is, but as you scale up and as you go up, you know, you have to convince an incoming investor that prospectively your thesis of your ability to build a team that can handle scale, that can pivot, that can still remain nimble, is there. That you are traction on the basis of which you probably were able to attract the first pre-seed or seed funding round has also grown, right? And third is that the target market that you are addressing is large enough for incoming investors to feel that there is merit in investing because there is scale at the other end of the efforts being put in by, by the team, right? Now, a lot of people can start, and that's perfectly right, you know, start a lifestyle business, um, adventure tourism, gourmet chocolates, and stuff like that, you know, while those may be very successful, promising business ideas. But if you are going to pitch to seek capital, which in today's environment, you may also fortunately or unfortunately receive, and then only to find that your venture did not have the DNA to scale, to be able to take multiple rounds of investments and constantly grow. Because a unicorn, a startup, this funding, this entire thing means that very quickly with the capital that you receive, you will show very, very sharp growth. If you don't show sharp growth, investors lose interest. And only if you show sharp growth, but very rightly as Deepak said, on the basis of the fundamental economics and what a business should have, at some way along the other, it could fall like a pack of cards. It could even happen to ventures which have received maybe two or three rounds of funding and have large enough, but they suddenly find that they're going nowhere. So be very, very mindful. Not every startup venture has the DNA to absorb and do justice to risk capital. The stat of any startup to become a unicorn will seldom go beyond what we have today. If the base grows big, if the needs that we are targeting are relevant, the unicorn number at the top will grow, but it will not grow disproportionately more only because 
more capital is available because remember at the end of the day, the team traction TAM equation must be fulfilled for people to continue investing in our journey. Yeah, thanks. Just to add, uh, you know, what uh, Vikas sir and uh, Deepak mentioned, you know, regarding this dilution of equity and, you know, the DNA structure to uh, just two examples, you know, um, the entire food delivery market in India is less than $6 billion. But the valuation of only two companies, Zomato and Swiggy, is much more than $10 billion. Now, what we are betting on here, you know, the market is not there, but we are betting on the lifetime value, you know, and we are also betting on the kind of pie which is going to get increased in, say, five year down the time or three year down the time, right? So when an investor puts money into you based upon the team and the target audiences which you are catering to and the traction which you have, but then they also look into the kind of volumes which are going to be derived from such business models. You know, people are putting money, you know, one of the highest valued startups called Tesla, you know, they, they, they might be, you know, selling fewer number of cars right now, but people are betting on mobility. You know, many startups in India right now are raising funds for mobility sector because it is very, very certain that EV mobility is going to be the next big thing in India. Similarly, you know, people like us who ventured out into non-fungible tokens or cryptocurrency exchanges, you have seen a, 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 an amazing rise in the funding uh, ecosystem in last one year or so, right? Uh, and one more thing is very, very important to understand is that, you know, uh, as an entrepreneur, you know, when you are solving a problem, uh, the problem is not with the equity. The problem is with the runway which you need to have to actually fly right so whenever you raise money say if even if you raise say a series a or a seed round people will ask you why do you need money right and if you have no answer uh, to that question that they are not going to give you money right deepak so you know whenever a student come to me and say Ki mujhe paisa chahiye, you know i need money for what right you have to show me uh, the expenses which you are going to incur, you know, they will answer, okay, we want to, uh, you know, do business development or say hire some resources. Uh, then, you know, we need to uh, actually uh, put some money into digital marketing and stuff like that. But that is something which we need to understand from the long-term perspective, uh, right? And after, after say, I'm putting in money, say, say, say $100,000 in your initial seed round, uh, again, you will come to me, say, after eight months or so that, you know, my money has gone. Now I want to raise, say, uh, a couple of more millions so that I can have a runway of around one year or six months, right? So once you are, uh, you know, uh, attached to an investor, you also have to take care of that investor. And investor also need to make sure that the money which he has put in your startup uh, is multiplied, right? So again, he will pump in. So uh, to the audiences which we have right now, uh, majority of them are students, we need to uh, also you know, let them know that you know, this entire one, mil one billion club when you reach, you also have to take care of all the stakeholders and the stakeholders will take care of you. And that's why when you start working, the DNA need to be strong. And that DNA is your team, is you, and also the initial investor which are coming up with you. You know, one of the problem which we faced while we raising funds was that, you know, who is the lead investor, you know, and those lead investor, which we hear about like SoftBank or Sequa Capital or, you know, Antler or these guys never come in seed round. So that initial runway is very, very important. And for that runway, if you need to dilute your equity or say convertible bonds, if you are, you know, very much aware about the ecosystem uh, of what VC plays around, then you have to make sure that, you know, you also take care of all those stakeholders so that your uh, larger goal is achieved. <laughs> Over to you, uh, Neha or Vikas or Deepak. Uh, um, I, I'll, just, I'll just pitch in there. Sorry, Neha. Uh, so, so what uh, Kapil mentioned is absolutely on point and I second that. Um, <clears throat> just a quick uh, point that I have to make here is what the startup ecosystem has done uh, essentially in India um, is by the advent of Shark Tank. Uh, I think what has, what has become is now entrepreneurship has become a very household name. Uh, now I'll give you a very classic example, right? I was in the UK um, and I and I came back uh, to Calcutta in my home city just like four, to, like just like three to four days back. Um, and uh, since Shark Tank India was released, just uh, I think uh, a few a couple of months back, I did not have access to TV. 
because i was in the i was in the uk and i was i was pursuing my masters there and i did not have access to tv so i did not get uh, you know i did not get to watch any any episode of shark tank india and i used to see a lot of memes you know by you know ashneel grover and you know uh, amit gupta aman gupta and and, and uh, all of those all, all of these entrepreneurs and i did not used to resonate with all of this but when i came when i got back here the first thing i saw was one episode of shark tank india with with my family around and my mother being a housewife uh, she said that it's a great show she she has no idea about what entrepreneurship is she just knows about the traditional businesses right how a business is run because that's that's where we essentially come from uh but when she, when i was you know very intrigued as an entrepreneur to see how shark tank india has emerged as a show uh you know uh, she said that you know uh, you know the, the founder of lens card is such a great the great human piyush bansal and there are so many other entrepreneurs who are sitting on the seat she is like this he is like that and so on and so forth so now entrepreneurship has become a household name in the remotest parts of the country as well right and I, and i and i felt so happy seeing seeing my mother talk about uh, entrepreneurship seeing my mother talk about funding she said are usko paisa nahi mila uska business acha nahi tha i mean that's that, that's great news in terms of a startup ecosystem that's great news in terms of entrepreneurship becoming a household name because how however the show is however the show is whether it's good or bad or how much ever it is it is being criticized it is a start in a good direction and that in itself is important awareness is important about startups because a lot of students and i know this because i i graduated like 5 years back and i started up when I, while i was in college so i understand how the youth thinks about starting up uh, they they have this vague idea about funding they have this vague idea about you know uh, i have this great idea should i just start up or um, i'll i'll build the team as as uh, you know along the way and you know i'll raise funds why do you need to raise funds do you have any idea whatsoever whether you actually need to raise funds or is it just the glam that attracting you so again uh, i think shows like shark tank india and other other shows like you know uh, like the normal sh- the shark tanks from the us create some sort of awareness in the sort of ecosystem especially in india where the youth wants to enter the ecosystem and tries to sort of capture the market it's a it's just it, it's a step in the right direction i think over to you neha um thank you deepak since this is home based for me i'll be a little candid and share my experience with why i thought one fundraise wasn't necessary in the previous company and why i think fundraising in the current company is i mean we are on the treadmill it's a treadmill you can't get off it so my previous venture which still of course continues to run very well was um, is in the business of manufacturing clean cook stoves essentially matti ke chule ka replacement and um, also pulling revenues to carbon offsets and all of that so back in 2015 money was available it's a business which is not a tech business as such it's a very brick and mortar business it's a huge market but a very difficult market since it's bottom of the pyramid you know you kind of have to overcome patriarchy rural distribution all of that uh, back in 2015 16 we did raise uh, a round of capital which was you know around 2.5 million or so 2.5 used to be series a back then it's seed now uh, that kind of a thing and we did raise money and um, if i look back now and we subsequently were able to give uh, you know some kind of an exit to our investors as well but if i look back that round of capital didn't really change the course of the business it did not necessarily accelerate um, our sales or operations or even supply chain capacity beyond the point and if i think at it i mean i'm being very very candid here i don't think i've said this out loud before but it was perhaps unnecessary i mean things wouldn't have been very different with it was nice like a lot of people congratulated us the paisa raised kar liya I would go back and say that have you even seen my product? Please, you know, congratulate me on the product. Is given as a pesa raise one, but have you even seen the product? And this, uh, there is, uh, you know, just this glamour around fundraisers. But uh, once you're on this side, once you're actually starting up, you'll realize that that glamour is. I think that glamour is more for outsiders than insiders in the startup space. 
having said so in the in the current venture current venture is a fintech venture it's an investment platform and uh, this business the way it's designed is needs a certain amount of capex uh, right at the start and it comes with a big fiduciary responsibility towards retail investors so i would not want to cut any corners on ops or you know just risk management or otherwise and which is why for this one i think raising capital becomes important right at the start which is what we've gone ahead and done but having said so you know having been through those cycles it's not as glamorous on this side it it, it once you have a working product people are buying your product that is the satisfaction you're looking for and if you have capital and you don't have the satisfaction of people buying your product it's it's a very distressing space to be in uh i have a question for the fellow panelists so now that we are discussing about discussing about raising funds and how uh, you know certain sectors are uh, investors are bullish towards certain sectors so uh, as we have seen that unicorns in the current scenario are coming out from fintech and e-commerce sector so most of the unicorns are coming out of these two sectors so is it a thing that the vcs or investors are bullish about one particular sector and it's certain particular sectors which are you know getting a push in this ecosystem or we have seen an all round increase investment across every kind of startups so over the past year most of the startups that coming up have been fintech whether be it b2c or b2b side and the other bunch has been e-commerce basically uh, d2c companies that have come up or uh, fashion e-commerce uh, websites so the question is like where do you think the next bunch of startups would be coming in would it be the same sectors dominating the market or uh, have other uh, sectors gained the momentum to raise funding and be able to grow so you know uh, the unicorns have actually come from quite a few diverse sectors and especially in the last 2 years you can easily add edtech you can add health tech you can add saas you can add gaming now so nobody comes with a thesis that i will only invest in a particular sector there are funds who would restrict maybe their interest because they have deep domain connects and relationships and network that they feel they can bring to the venture and co create value so one of the most important things when any early stage founder is setting out the journey remember you are doing it because you believe in what you are starting will create future prospective value and you are willing to throw everything aside and give the whole of you in the pursuit of building a large scale business around that idea now just as deepak was saying now if you truly believe that this is going to become something big then you should really be very very circumspect and cautious about giving away equity because as much equity that you part with will be a value that you will not be lot accrue to you but to someone else so you got to make that balance you need funding but you also kind of are aware that you are permanently giving away ownership of your company to third parties so you must ask yourself a question when i get this funding am i getting the right business partner not just the investor there is a difference you have to look at the right business partner because you know you may not be aware and you start to become aware as you scale up that you may have thought that all you need is funding and the rest will take care of itself but you realize that you know you need funding you get need access to networks relationships you need access to people who can bring in domain experts to help you you need help in getting the right talent you also need to help need to get the help to get the right kind of visibility so that you know there's a larger buzz of confidence around your venture so one you funding may be necessary but ask yourself that what is the total So, you know set of resources that i'm getting that i need from the right business partner and then enter into that partnership because remember anybody who enters your business as an investor is going to stay with you for a very very long time 
So you need to have that decision made very carefully. Now, the rule of thumb that I would advise, again, because we are talking to students, is that when you are faced with trying to raise funding, the one thing that you must very clearly articulate and say, hey, listen, right? I have some traction. In the absence of that, it's going to be very difficult for you to attract funding, right, from, from anyone. And the confidence you must aspire in the incoming or prospective investor is, listen, I will have future paying customers that I don't have today. But to get to those people, I need some funding so that when I, as an investor, am evaluating, I must equally get that confidence that, all right, you will have future paying customers from what I see, from where you're headed, from the traction team and a few other things. Therefore, I'm willing to underwrite, build a bridge of my resources with your energies and passion and whatever else that you have so that you end up in a stage when those future paying customers actually materialize. And then the thesis and the justification for making the investment works out. So remember, you know, when you're doing a startup, it's not just that you get excited about an idea and you think everybody else should get excited. And because you have so much of passion and you're doing it and you can see it very big, unless you can articulate in a manner that is very business-like and understood by the incoming partners, you may have challenges in not just raising your funds, but also getting customers on board that you need. Remember, the best source of funding, and I think Deepak spoke about that, Kapil spoke about that, the best source of funding in your business are paying customers. You have to create the confidence that till such time that I have an adequate scale of paying customers, I'm on my way, I will take investor money, but no more than what you can do your business with, with paying customers. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> If any of the fellow panelists have anything to add on the same lines. <clears throat> yeah, uh, real quick, uh, you know, since we are addressing students, uh, we need to also understand, you know, these unicorns, which we are talking in the year 2022, they actually started somewhere in 2015, 16, 17, you know, there is a, a startup called Mensa who got a billion, year, uh, billion dollar uh, club membership in just six months, but these are exception. So we are talking to students and I think what is the next big thing which they could focus uh, to be part of the unicorn club in say next five years, right? Uh, 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 sir is there, you know, uh, who graduated in 80, 85 or, you know, 90s. Uh, I'm there and, uh, uh, you know, Neha is there. I think Deepak is much younger. We graduated in two, 2000s, right? So 90s was for web 1.0, okay? Uh, web 1.0 is very simple, uh, just one way of communication via internet. Then came, you know, the Facebooks, the Google, the YouTubes, you know, all this thing in 2000s, right? 2000 to 2010, right? And now we are talking about web 3.0, right? So the migration, from web 2.0 to web 3.0 is inevitable, right? So if a new guy approaches me, you know, that, you know, what is the next thing which we do? Yes, whatever you can do in web 2.0, you can also do it in web 3.0. The things are changing very, very fast. And we also need to make sure that, you know, the coming generation, uh, which are going to be part of the startup ecosystem should focus on more efficient, more decentralized system where in this monopolies of you know the Googles and Facebooks of the world are taken away. You know, these business models which we are thinking right now or in the last one decade or two decades is going to change drastically. It will be more peer-to-peer, -peer, it will be more decentralized, it will be less monopolized, right? And the power will be with the people who are actually using it, right? So there is the opportunity wherein we, if we talk to the new generation who is coming into the startup ecosystem should also think about being part of this new dynamics called Web 3.0. Over to you, Deepak or Neha. Um, uh, I'll just pitch in uh, because uh, the question was, you know, which domains uh, funding is redirected towards. I think, uh, 
as vikas had rightly pointed out about edtech we being an edtech firm is we strongly firmly believe that um, a lot of funding is directed towards edtech firms but uh, two domains i think in addition to edtech fint fintech uh, health, health tech uh, where funding is re- re- redirected towards would be a uh, i'm sure kapil would uh, uh, you know second me on that would be cryptocurrency exchanges uh, with the rise of cryptocurrency and nfts and metaverse i'm sure a uh, lot of uh, indian cryptocurrency exchanges have raised you know, multiple rounds of funding and uh, try to capture the market as much as they can uh, and the second would be content companies so i've seen a lot of uh, content companies like tag mango pepper content raise uh, raise funds um tag regarding tag mango um, it's it's one of my batchmates he's a friend of mine i've known him for 25 years and i'm just 26 now so uh, <laughs> considering uh, you know the considering the founder dynamics uh, i've understood that uh, content companies uh, will raise uh, a lot of funds in the coming years there will be a surge uh, in more content companies considering whether it's content monetization or giving content ideas and you know building a company wherein uh, the technology and the ai will enable you to give ideas to your company in terms of uh, developing certain marketing strategies i think uh, content companies will raise uh, funds and there will be a surge in content companies um, in the in the in the coming decade or so because we've seen the the rise as 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 in how the uh, influ- you know as in how the companies have started raising funds in india we've seen that a lot of companies have started investing in influencer marketing as well uh, and that, and that's where i also come from because being a creator i know that a lot of companies especially with crypto you know i'm associated with coin switch uh, you know that's that's where um, i come from and i see that so many funded companies are in, investing in influencer marketing which of course directly correlates to content so uh, my idea is my hunch is uh, two kinds of domains that will receive funding and there'll be more more such companies in the coming decade would be uh, a uh, in the crypto nft metaverse space and second would be content companies so my my take here would be to build something that uh, you feel a personal connection to it's uh, and then see what space or which sector it fits into because as an entrepreneur it will be just very, it's very very important to really believe in what you're doing it's you'll have moments where things don't seem to be working out you'll have moments you know you'll have plenty of those moments which is why having some kind of um, a, a desire to make this work that's coming from inside which is is uh, super super critical if you don't feel very strongly for what you're trying to build then maybe it's time to we need to take some more time before you take the call to go ahead and build it you see again just to you know approach this from a sector perspective so deepak you are in the edtech space right it is the third coming of the edtech sector and you could have felt that edtech we go places but then i think as kapil said that you know there was no broadband no geo no smartphone no upi no nothing and also covid you know that even though people could see the opportunity but the gap between where you were and the time and the commensurate resources you needed did not make a complete triangle at tech guys got funded uh, they struggled many didn't survive some who did there was a second coming and they got more funded and they became big and in the third wave of course i mean even at tech has got i think more than a dozen unicorns and unicorns right so the same thing could play out you know as kapil said web 1.0 2.0 3.0 so it could mean that some of the sectors and the drivers of success of those sectors could completely transform and therefore entry for new startups has the power to disrupt you know so that you could come in what seemed like a mature busy crowded space but because you have combined the evolving resource you know resource pool more smartly than what some of the legacy people could have done you could succeed 
So why did the electric car did not come out of Toyota or General Motors or Ford or Daimler or Volkswagen, right? Exactly the same thing, that these could be matured industries, but because <clears throat> sorry, the resource pool you know, and the opportunity and the disruption is, is moving so fast that you could actually create some ventures very, very fast, purely because the way the dynamics are at play. So it's as, and, and I think I fully, fully support what Neha said. When things around you are moving at a very fast pace, you need to stand still and focus and absolutely tick all those boxes. And I say three boxes because these are students, I'll put it in a very simple language. If you're looking at a startup idea, ask yourself three questions. One, does this interest me? Which means if it comes my way, does it naturally bring out my excitement, my energy, and I feel like doing it, right? Second, am I good at it? You may get excited. You may do a noggin dance at a party and get claps, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a good dancer, right? Am I good at it? Am I getting genuine traction? Am I getting genuine appreciation or validation of what I'm doing? And third is whatever I'm good at, and whatever is of interest to me, is it prospective commercially? The third step is where a lot of people don't pay adequate attention and they get carried away by the fact that they like to do it, they are good at it, and there seems to be an opportunity in the jump. But the thesis of your startup have to be very, very sharp. So when you are putting yourself through whether I'm good at it, means you need validation that you're actually really good at it, you stand out. If it interests you, you've got to see and log and say, if I, it interests me, how much time have I spent spontaneously on my own over the last two years into this? Or ever since I became aware of something that I think I'm good at. And third is, all right, now what is the commercial traction prospectiveness of this? The first two are probably 30% of the equation and the 70% is the validation of whether this is prospective or not. And that is where a lot of rigor, hard work, validation, trying a few things will tell you that this has the making of a venture which will go somewhere and therefore you should put yourself into it wholly and take it forward. Sir, uh, Vikas, sir, I have one of <clears throat> a very, sorry, very direct questions to you. So are angel investors and VCs in today's time at all worried about the startups going profitable? I mean, since they buy in an, uh, a startup at its revenue multiple and sell it to private equity on revenue multiple as well. So, or is it just that they uh, look after growth? Uh, you know, there's no one answer to this. So let me sort of touch upon a point which was raised and then come to this question. And I think Deepak brought in Shark Tank and what it has done. Honestly, I have never seen a Shark Tank uh, episode in my life. For whatever I have seen, snatches of it, you know, overseas and whatever, I personally came to a single conclusion that this is mis-selling and distorting the notion of what a startup is for somebody who wants to do a startup. You know, it's, it's an item song which will have a lot of excitement. You will feel like it. You will dance in various parties and talk about it. But it doesn't mean that your ambitions to become a dancer should be to become an item dancer. So there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of, I can see why it has got tremendous entertainment value. Okay. But it is not about how you approach a startup right now. If you are saying that whether VCs or angel investors focus on profit, they focus on the ability of the venture to scale so that the investment is also enhanced. And when you invest, you know, as I said, on the various things, the one and only objective that you, the investor, and you, the founder, have, are you aligned in when you are becoming business partners? Are you aligned? Is that bringing what the founder does and bringing what the investor does? Is this genuinely enhancing 
are going to enhance the earning power of the venture. In the early stages, you've got to worry about that if the earning power of the venture is going to happen as a result of the resource infusion, which I said is more than just funding, right? And you just don't leave it there. You obviously have performance milestones. You have other kind of SLAs and understanding because usually, more often than not actually, the investment will come to you in tranches. I may have in principle committed to let's say put in a million dollars in a venture, but it'll not be written all in one shot. It may come to you in three tranches. Right? Each tranche would only follow if the performance milestones that were mutually agreed were indeed adhered to, or you got there in sort of letter and spirit and you release the next set of resources, right? Now, whether you are focusing on growth or profitability, there's no one answer. It's a combination because, you know, as Kapil said, that unicorns not making money have got listed successfully, right? So what does that tell you? that people are prepared to invest at various stages because different kinds of investors have different kinds of investment thesis who are prepared to invest in the long-term growth, getting you to a scale where it will get into creating genuine economic value for the investors. Before these listings, if you see, the sole criteria for listing and going public in India was balance sheet driven. Was PNL driven? Are you making money? Are you profitable already? Okay, then I think I will kind of you know invest in the venture. That has changed today. It is now on the prospective value that you will create in the long term. The track record of how you have created every successful level of growth and scale while improving your unit economics. And even though why you still not may not be where traditional IPOs were happening, people say, let's look through this and feel that, you know, we will get the value that we need tomorrow because there are very few investors, you know, who would kind of take that view. But usually those are the ones who then are patient, they write big checks, and then they also bring, as I said, a lot of other things onto the venture. And it's not as if they write a check and then wait for things to happen. They proactively work, they sit on the board, they have rights, there are shareholder agreements, there are all kinds of other you know, partnership documents in which you collectively work to de-risk the business. Right? The, whole, the whole thesis of investment is to what extent can this partnership de-risk or increase the probability of success? Beyond that, who knows, right? So that's that I would say is the broad answer. You have to work towards increasing, enhancing the earning power. You have to work jointly to de-risk the business so that you are able to get to the point where you have now sustained recurring growth and finally reaching a destination where your customers are paying and no longer the investors. Thank you for answering that, Vikas, sir. As we head to the conclusion of the panel discussion, if any of the panelists have any advice for the fellow students or uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, I think that'll be the time. I will give one advice. One advice, okay? You know, you, you hear a lot of these stories about, oh, entrepreneurs, they take risks. You know, entrepreneurs are bold. They're going to uncharted. Let me tell you, entrepreneurs, do not take risks. Entrepreneurs, in fact, manage and mitigate risk. They have taken the risk by walking away from a job that was offered to them on a campus, whether it's IIT or FMS or wherever else. So they have written off the opportunity cost or whatever else it may be. Sometimes people make huge write-offs on the opportunity cost. They leave jobs in McKinsey's and Microsoft's and wherever else and start at the bottom of the pyramid, creating a startup. So don't kind of get that this notion, this is a wild journey of excitement of taking risks. No, it is not. It is a very, very disciplined, rigorous, measured steps towards de-risking your business once you've taken a decision to move there because you're working for one and only one thing, to create value in your business, for which you need to mitigate and minimize the risk, 
and collectively with partners and stakeholders. So remember this. This is a very important distinction because you require more discipline, more rigor, more ethical balance in your life, you know, to succeed as an entrepreneur, you know, more eye for detail, you know, more ability to handle and multitask, you know, that won't happen if you think you've just gone out there and taken risks. That will absolutely, you will horribly go wrong. If that's the reason why you jump in, that I like to ski, therefore I can also, you know. So remember this, I, that's the last thing I would say, but keep in mind, this is very, very important when you are taking a decision, whether you want to take a job and whether you want to be an entrepreneur, do not get sort of swayed and allured by this modern day tab of success of, you know, an entrepreneur is a guy who is with it. And a people, people who are taking jobs in multinational companies are stodgy. Multinational companies are very enterprising entities. Large companies successful are very enterprising companies. It is perfectly possible to bring entrepreneurial energy within a very, what's looked like a very, very well structured job in your organization. In fact, if you don't do that, you will not succeed. So you, there is enough room to play out your entrepreneurial journey and ambition, even within the job in the right sort of company, organization, yeah. So when it comes a time of placement, be there. All of you should not be sitting in the other room wanting to go to incubation centers, right? If you do, fine. But do remember that this is not such a you know, no-brainer. If I go towards entrepreneurship, I'm appealing to a higher order set of choices in life. And what's there in taking a job at Unilever or, or a bank or something or a McKinsey or something, right? No, there is enough room for you to entrepreneurially bring success to yourself in your career. And maybe later on in life, you can, if you come across what I said, this combination that you could look for pure freestanding autonomous entrepreneur, which as you can see from the panels, you have three great examples. One uh, quick uh, suggestion, just to complement what Vikas has mentioned. See, uh, you know, many of the students who are listening uh, are at ideation stage, you know. So one quote which I always follow is ideation without execution is an illusion. Okay, so, uh, you know, if you just type in Google and say, you know, this is the idea you are working on, there will be like hundreds of thousands of search results, people are working on the same stuff. It's the execution which you are, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you have to be master in it, right? And these skill sets uh, cannot be in one person. So you need to also build up a team. So the initial co-founders which you choose, right? Suppose you're a mechanical engineer and I'm talking about Web 3.0. So right now, you know, people like Deepak and, you know, AdTech is booming. You can learn things real, real quick, at least to monitor the people who are, who are going to work on these projects, right? So it's very, very important that, you know, just sticking to idea, not pivoting, you know, not validating. Uh, you know, again, the point mentioned by uh, Vikas, sir, it, it is very, very crucial, right? So it's a make or break thing because you are at your, uh, say, 23, 24, 25 years of age, uh, you know, especially, you know, uh, females, right? Uh, they, they may be, uh, you know, having some kind of constraints, you know, people from marginalized, marginalized societies have some kind of constraints, right? People who are youth also have some kind of opportunity cost. For example, when I was in the US, people were, you know, actually pushing me to apply for say, you know, these exams like UPSC and everything, uh, you know, so you have so many things in your hand when you are at this age group, you just need to be, focused, understand what you are good at, as rightly mentioned by Vikas sir, and also need to work on the idea which you are, uh, which you are thinking of and execute it, and also build up a team and also attract resources, not only in terms of uh, money, but also in terms of people, because at the end of the day, you are fighting with existing you know, unicorns and you are going to be a unicorn. How can you be a unicorn? Because you need people, you need resources, you need more time, you need, you need to work as an individual uh, of around 100 people. So one person is equal to 100 person. So you are not having 24 hours, you are having 24 into 100 hours. You have to be very, very effective. So it, it's a journey, it's a lifestyle. And you have to be very, very focused once you take this entrepreneurial journey. Because after five years or six years or 10 years down the line, if you have not learned from the journey which you are having, 
you will be at a you know a, a, a bad position right but if you learn in the process then you may be a serial entrepreneur you know you may be a vc at one point in time and you can also understand business from a different perspective from the problem solving side of it so just to summarize best of luck to everyone and ho uh, jaye no problem over to you deepak or neha uh yeah i'll just take over um, i i think one there's one thing that i heard um a few years ago wherein uh, it said that entrepreneurs get too busy pitching to the investors rather than pitching to the customers and i think that's where that's that's probably the summary of the entire panel discussion uh if i may call it uh but i have one you know one one point to make especially since we're addressing a pool of students uh, a pool of youngsters uh i know where your enthusiasm comes from i know where your uh, rigor and uh, dedication comes from uh, all of it uh, can go to waste if it's if it's not coming from uh, the right rationale um as neha mentioned if you are not passionate about that particular business or that particular model or that particular product you will not be able to sustain because that in itself uh, you know that's the wrong reason to start up if your reason to start up is fame and getting money and all of that uh it's probably a wrong reason to start up uh one right reason to start up would be to solve a problem that's that's all that's all if you're passionate about the product if you're passionate about the kind of business you're building you will be uh you will be more intrigued and you'll be more you'll have the zeal to work towards it even more so that's that uh get in it just do not get into it just because you see the glamorized world about entrepreneurship and you see that you know people have raised funds and people uh, you know a lot of startups have regained unicorn status so you think you'll start up tomorrow and within say 6 months 8 months one year two years down the line you'll become a unicorn that does not happen as vikas sir rightly pointed out thousands of cricketers you know uh, go for net practice i have played cricket professionally uh, for Cr- cricket association of bengal uh, at the division level once aimed and vision to play for india but of course uh, there there are there's only one ms dhoni there's only one sachin tendulkar uh, so so again uh, think of it as something that uh, you know as, as as a game understand that you will get through it if you if you are in it for the right reasons uh, i have one question uh, to to all the all, all the fellow panelists before we sign off uh, there's this pro, pro, you know popular thought uh, around the startup ecosystem where it says that do not leave your job to start up and i'd love to know from you guys if it's actually true or if it's actually a myth uh so uh, anybody if you if you could you know uh, take on that would be great deepak i'll go here i mean to answer your question Please go on. i have never had a job so i have always I five. I five to that. Yeah, so so 14 15 years now and uh, I mean so I cannot really answer that question but I can definitely say that just you know being full time and what you want to do is critical it's uh, if you really want to especially raise external capital and so it's you cannot uh, you know have your um, kind of freedom I mean I, what what my hunch is it's like a game of poker you got to go all in it's 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 as simple as that you got to go all in and uh, to kind of come back uh, just I, i want to make two quick points one is that if you're looking to start up uh, think of it as a business you don't think of it as you know we'll raise money and then so and so and so many things will happen think of it as a proper business and yes of course businesses need capital think of it from you know a capital budgeting point of view i do want to come back to couples point women don't have any constraints people think women have constraints women don't have, no, have any it's constraints it's not every one of us has some constraints uh, it's not specific yeah, so everyone have open yeah just yeah, to I, i so you know there are lots of these um, i mean i just want to like say this out loud again there are lots of these women entrepreneur programs which you know tell women that you need to do this 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 to come at par with uh, you know with with the rest of us you don't i mean if a woman is starting up for the women who are here in this student panel you've already overcome a whole bunch of barriers to be where you are you're already you know superstars and you've proven yourself just it, it's 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 going to be easier for women than men because you know we we come through this perception we walk through this perception of oh how is she doing this how will she do this she is already doing this wonderful i just like to say one thing before i sign off 
So when I took the example of that one Dhoni, one Tendulkar, it was true for our generation, right? That was the stat. You guys, you have a terrific opportunity, just like as I said that the startup ecosystem is very, very supportive right now, it's like the IPL. So today, a lot of people can start and go to play cricket with confidence, with passion, knowing that they will have a very large chance of being part of the ecosystem, maybe as players, maybe as coaches, maybe as managers, maybe as this. Maybe. So therefore, for you guys, you know, the, the, the opportunity to pursue entrepreneurship as a career is a lot more well settled than was in our case. I spent the first 20 years of my life, you know, working, traveling around the world till, till you know, I felt that I could do something that my company wasn't prepared to do, but I could. And then I stepped out and did it myself. So, you know, but it took me 20 years to launch myself into the escape velocity to get to done things. You guys can start, but remember what Kapil said, idea, execution. Remember what Deepak said, do by yourself. Don't think that, you know, somebody will fund and bail you out. And what Neha said, if you don't have the passion, if you don't think you're all in, you will probably flounder at some point in time. Thank you and all the best to you. And I hope that you guys have super careers in whatever you may decide to pursue. All the best. And just one last quick point before we sign off, um, if you allow. Uh, a lot of times we fear starting and that, you know, you know, and that that's, I mean, I've, I've, heard, I've heard this one thing that the start is the most difficult step and the start is what stops most people. So uh, I think from, from the place where I come from, where I had to convince my parents to allow me to, uh, to you know, start up and uh, to allow me to enter into the field of content creation. I think they are much more risk takers than I am <laughs> because they have sort of allowed me to end to foray into a domain which is absolutely very uncertain in terms of uh, money making and security. But uh, but just one thing: be courageous enough to start because the start is what stops most people. Uh, once you start, you will figure things out. But once you don't start, uh, you will always keep on procrastinating, thinking when to start. Okay, tomorrow is the day I'll, I'm going to start. It's like me planning to go to the gym. I'm going to go tomorrow. I'm going to go tomorrow. I'm going to go tomorrow. That tomorrow never comes. So again, uh, that's just like uh, you know. Please do not procrastinate. Start. It's the most courageous step. You will think twice. You will think about embarrassment. You will think about failures. You will think about what people will think of you. All of that is what all of these thoughts will come to you, but you got to do what you got to do. Take the first step, take the plunge, take the leap of faith, have the process, trust the process, go for it. Thank you, everyone. I'm sure getting opinions on the unicorns and startups and their successes and failures and learning what entrepreneurs build has added a lot of value to all the students here. Now I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our fellow panelists on the behalf of our entrepreneurship cell uh, team and FMS Delhi for such an informat uh, informative and insightful discussion. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone. Yeah.